wait for the Zoom to kick on here, Jane. All right, welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. It is February 15th, uh, Wednesday morning, and we're here with the Executive Director of the Vermont Democratic Party, um, and I've asked Jim to give us his feedback on our uh, draft miscellaneous elections bill. So, uh, Jim, welcome to the committee, and uh, please introduce yourself for the record and tell us what you think. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, good morning to the members of the Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee. I'm Jim Dandino. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Democratic Party, um, and we have we work to engage uh, Vermonters in the political process at every level, from municipal uh, town committees all the way through federal elections. Um, we have party members holding leadership positions in about half the towns in the state. Um, in cities and towns ranging from Burlington to Maidstone with robust active party organizations in every county. Um, you have my written testimony um, in your files and I know how much everybody hates when people read their written testimony that they submitted. So I am just going to hit a couple of the high points. Um, these are the Vermont Democratic Party's thoughts on the proposed elections bill. Um, with regard to the sore loser law, um, uh, you know, big picture stuff, this, uh, this bill does a good job of streamlining information for voters. Um, the sore loser law, the independent candidate filing deadline alignment, um, and the cross nominations all help provide clearer, uh, more concise information to voters. Party affiliation is shorthand for folks. Uh, people have a lot of stuff going on in their lives, they're very busy, oftentimes when you have a crowded election like we did in 2022 with a lot going on, people don't have the bandwidth to um, find out all of the information that they might like to know about the candidates for office. So all of these pieces um, help provide clearer information to voters. The sore loser law, um, giving folks one bite at the apple, um, helps narrow that information down. Um, you know, People who run in a primary and lose have already had the will of the voters expressed. And we have open primaries. We have, it's very easy to participate in elections at every phase of the process for Vermonters. Um, and I think when the will of the voters is expressed in the primary, to, have, to give folks who lose those primaries the opportunity to run again under a different party line helps kind of muddy the water. Um, in that information that's provided to voters. They can say, you know, wh wh why is this person still on as a Republican? I already voted against them as a Democrat. Um, so limiting it to one shot in an election really helps kind of narrow that focus for folks with limited bandwidth for gathering information. Um, aligning the independent candidate filing deadline with the major party candidate fil filing deadline is uh, another way of making sure that voters have ample time to gather information about the candidates that are running for office. It also uh, makes it, quite frankly, for us, it makes it easier to plan, it makes it easier to understand. There are still ample opportunities to fill vacant spots on the ballot. Uh, parties have the ability to nominate, their candidates have the opportunity to run as write-in candidates for empty ballot lines after the filing deadline. Uh, and it is not, unheard of for, it's actually fairly common for candidates to uh, run write-in campaigns in the primary and win that party line. Um, and to kind of jump ahead in the bill, um, I do really appreciate the, um, the section about filing a consent of candidacy form two weeks before the election if you are a serious write-in candidate. Um, if you are a serious write-in candidate who is running for an open ballot line, you can't throw that together in two weeks for a primary and have a realistic expectation of getting enough votes to qualify anyway. And if you are a serious candidate running a write-in in a contested general election, then if you are not running more than two weeks ahead of time, you are not going to win that general election, right? If you are running in a contested race as a write-in candidate and you have a serious expectation of winning, that is not something that you could throw together a week before election day when Quite frankly, people have already been voting for five weeks before that, right? So, um, I, you know, the, uh, my sarcasm in the written testimony aside, I do really hate having to scroll through 85 columns on the Excel spreadsheet to collect the results after the election. Uh, but realistically speaking, this is an undue burden on town clerks to have to list every single Donald Duck vote that was cast. Um, and it doesn't, 
make it any easier for us. Literally, sometimes folks voting for Donald Duck. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, constantly. And it's not, you know, and I heard yesterday's testimony, some folks were saying that it's disrespectful to the will of the voters to not count every single Donald Duck voter. Um, I think the will of the voter is adequately expressed by casting a write-in ballot when there is no write-in candidate. Um, and we don't need to force our clerks to tally up every single Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck vote in the election. Um, on the, um, the self identify uh, I'm sorry, the, the self-certification and the submission of uh, the town and county uh, leadership that have organized, um, that is another piece of information that is helpful for us and helpful for voters. We are entering into the delegate selection process. I've been neck deep in planning for delegate selection for the 2024 National Nominating Convention. And there's a piece in there that says that we need to um, ensure that bona fide Democrats are the delegates that we send to the National Party Convention. And right now, and even with, even with this section um, implemented into law, it is still an act of faith on the party's part naming people as bona fide Democrats for, as eligible for those delegate roles. But it is another data point. If someone was a Republican town chair in 2023 and they run to be a, a Joe Biden delegate at the Democratic National Convention, as it currently stands, unless that person is identifying themselves publicly as a Republican town chair, we have no way of discovering that they are a member of the Republican Party and they could feasibly get elected um, to the National Convention as a delegate. And this applies for the Republicans as well. There is no way of knowing if someone was the chair of the Brandon Democrats who then decides to run to be uh, a Nikki Haley delegate, right? Um, this would provide public information. And I'm, I'm comfortable with tweaks to the level of information that is provided to the Secretary of State's office. If there is a privacy concern, then I, you know, town and name is probably more than enough for us to uh, publicly identify this person. Um, same goes for the uh, cross-nomination process. Um, this, again, streamlining the information available to voters. Um, I want to just use an example, um, the abortion bill that the House passed last week, I believe, uh, protecting uh, reproductive health providers and people seeking reproductive care in Vermont. Um, that bill uh, passed eight to four out of committee, I believe, and I got a text message from a reporter saying, what's the deal with this guy who voted against it? Why is, he, why is one of your people voting against it? And I looked and that person was a Republican and um, had won the uh, nomination on a write-in on the Democratic line and was listed as RD. And if a reporter doesn't know this, then we can't reasonably expect the general public who is not professionally invested in understanding who everybody in this building is and how they vote and what their political affiliations are. It's not, it, it's not reasonable to expect uh, regular voters to understand that as well. So limiting cross-nomination, um, I think helps streamline that information. I also think that um, the changes to the write-in statute that are proposed here might also help solve some of that problem. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to lean too heavily on any one aspect of it. Uh, my only flag on the demographic information uh, piece is that uh, we have unfortunately seen several representatives over the last several years uh, subject to some pretty vicious harassment um, and. Self-identification self and not mandating it helps to limit the potential for harassment, but there is, I think, when you, when you provide all of this information and create a culture of expectation around uh, filing this information about yourself as a candidate, there's a certain element of peer pressure that will push everybody to um, feel like they need to provide that, and I am concerned with providing a bus map for harassers, really. Um, if there's a way to decouple um, personally identifiable information from the demographic statistics, I think we would be wholeheartedly supportive of that. As of right now, it's something that we have some reservations about, um, just as a matter of protecting the folks that are willing to put themselves forward as candidates. Um, do you think as a matter of policy, Jim, on that note, um, that you feel better about the way the demographic information was 
kind of made available if, um, that's just as a matter of policy, if the Secretary of State's office would make it available to you know the press and people, but they didn't publish it. Uh, you know, just that there was that one layer where you know the, your average troll on Facebook, yeah. you know, had to go through one step in order to get access to the to all of the information. I think it's worth figuring out how to add that extra step to make it harder for the Facebook trolls to find those people. Yeah. Um, I'm not. Uh, you guys are. You guys are the experts. You guys are the professionals here. So I will defer to the committee's judgment. On, um, I'll defer to the committee's judgment on, on the actual mechanism for implementation. But um, even if it's you know even if it's just a, an aggregation, right? If if the Secretary of State's office can issue totals of the self-reporting without publishing who's what, um, you know who's a member of which demographic group, I think makes it a little bit harder for folks to track down who these people are. Are you good? No, thank you. Uh, Jim, thanks for the information, the feedback, and the insight. Um, I have a question about fusion candidates. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how many people, candidates, ran as fusions, as hybrids in the last cycle? You know, whether it's a PD, DP, RD. Not off the top of my head. I'm just curious about how like prevalent. It, it, it is as a percentage of people who identify with one party affiliation. I can dig that out. I don't have that number no, right, off yeah, the top of my head. You can shoot that to us. That'd yep. be <laughs> We'd love to see it just visually. Yep. Um, Jim, I wanted to go back to the um, the um, town and county and state uh, <coughs> committee members. Yeah, uh, that that reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so, right now, is it? It's kind of. It's my understanding that it's possible for somebody to be a, a committee member of multiple town parties because we don't really know who those folks are. Yes, right? if the Heinsberg Dems, Progs, and Republicans all caucus on separate days. Um, it is possible for someone to be a member of all three, so for someone to caucus with all three committees. Um, you know, the, the only real limitation is time and space. Um, your counterpart on, uh, the, uh, from the Republican Party yesterday had testified to the effect that uh, folks, you know, kind of want to be able to, to volunteer and be on these volunteer committees anonymously. And I'm trying to kind of understand the virtue of, you know, if you're somebody who goes and wants to join the committee and caucus at the town level mm -hmm. um, of keeping that, that person's at least name in town, I like the idea maybe of not publishing their address, <laughs> um, but at least allowing the parties to see, like, these are our committee members mm -hmm. um, so that there isn't that sort of, you know, I, I don't know that I would want to have somebody who is organizing in another party come over to my party as caucus as well and, and want to participate. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I think that in an ideal situation, the town party is a part of that town's civic life, right? Um, they are not, it's not just about elections. It's about um, providing, you know, building community. It's about making space for folks with shared values to discuss those values and to develop political power. Um, you know, it, a, and I think part of that is identifying who you are, right? Part of that is standing up for your beliefs and your values. And I have a tough time imagining folks who would be willing to put themselves out there and do the work of organizing a town committee than wanting to remain anonymous, right? Because what's the point? If, you know, if, if you're the member, if you're a member of the, the, um, the, the Arlington Democratic Committee, you're doing that because you care about democratic policies and democratic values and you want to help further those policy goals in Arlington, not telling people that you're a part of that committee. I mean, it's not even like there's prestige involved in being a member of the town committee, right? Like, what do you, what do you get from that besides the ability to talk to your friends and neighbors about what you care about? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I've been baffled by the the idea that there's virtue in the anonymity of, of the uh, party committee members. Um, 
but, but that assertion. Uh, I mean, it, it, it does kind of tie back to the issue of harassment for um, candidates from historically marginalized backgrounds, right? There is certainly, there are certainly people who will harass folks based on their party affiliation, <coughs> but decoupling the, right, like again, decoupling personal information from that, right? If Jim Dandino from, is a mem listed as a member of the Underhill Dems, there's an extra step involved in figuring out um, where I live and you know finding where my family is to, to go harass them. Um, but there's also, ver there's also value in me communicating that I am a member of the Town Democratic Party to friends and to like-minded uh, people around the state. Um, thank you. Other, yeah, other questions, sure. Um, so did you review yesterday's testimony from the other yeah, I watched. Workers. I did. Okay. I watched. Um, so Paul Dame from the GOP put this uh, thought on the table about a vetting process in the primaries mm -hmm. for the parties, mm -hmm. where they could sort of identify the identify a preferred candidate, I guess. Okay. Um, and then designate that that individual or individuals with some kind of marker of sorts on the ballot. I was just curious what your thoughts on that concept might be. I feel like what the Republican chair was asking for is um, something that is already available to parties. Um, there is nothing precluding the Vermont Democratic State Committee from passing a resolution saying that Representative Matt Byron does not represent the values of the Vermont Democratic Party and strongly encouraging Democrats voting in a primary to vote against him. For example, you're a good Democrat. No, no, no. We no, never no. do that to you. This uh, is we never do that. I never do that. Yes. But like, there's, there's, no hard feelings, Jim. There's, <laughs> um, there's nothing precluding the state party from doing that already. What yes. I think Paul is asking for is a way to mark them on the ballot, which is um, micromanaging. Okay. It, in to just kind of stop beating around the bush in Liam Madden's case the Republican State Committee could have said, this person is not a Republican, this person does not represent us, and it is the will of the state Republican, the Vermont State Republican Party that Liam Madden not be elected. We can't do anything to prevent him from getting your votes in our primary, but we want to communicate to our folks, to um, you know, partisan Republicans voting in this primary, that he is not who we would choose. And you know, you can do this a lot of different ways. You don't have to do it as a resolution by the state committee. You can do it by having state committee members publicly endorse at a press conference, right? And something like that, you know, if you're concerned about um, communicating that effectively to voters, a party state committee holding a press conference to de-endorse a potential candidate in their primary is news, right? That is statewide news. There is no way that that does not get, well, you know, heavy coverage. So I, I think it, it's, um, I think that Paul's suggestion is um, a little bit too much and um, already kind of available to people, to, to state parties. So one of the, the inherent things that we've been discussing as we've been looking at this bill, and we really just yesterday started to take testimony on mm -hmm. it, you know, we put it on the table and discussed some of the ideas in it the previous week, but it, there's an inherent tension in Vermont's primaries between having to be totally open, mm -hmm. um, both to the candidates and to the voters, mm -hmm. to sort of say, you know, this year I'm filing as a Democrat if I'm a candidate, or I'm filing as a Republican, I am voting on the Democratic ballot this primary year, the progressive the next, um, that it leads to a situation where candidates' um, connection to the, the activists, the parties, their platform and values if a party doesn't happen to run a candidate that's endorsed, let's say, by party activists, by the party committees, mm -hmm. et cetera, we don't really have an endorsement process, there's nothing stopping, I guess what I'm hearing you say is there's nothing stopping the county, local, or state parties from endorsing a candidate. So for instance, if there was no Democrat running on their line and there was a progressive that shared a lot of values in common, there's nothing stopping, even if we pass this bill, mm -hmm the Vermont Democratic Party from saying that independent or that progressive or even that Republican 
is the Democratic endorsed person, even if they only have one name on the ballot or yeah. one party on, endorsement on the ballot. Yeah, there's there's nothing preventing parties from publicly supporting who they want to support, and you know, logistically speaking, it's in the party's best interest to kind of have a light touch in those circumstances because you have to work with everybody after they get elected. So you don't want to alienate anybody by endorsing somebody that is going to come back to bite you. But there is, you know, in, in the case of somebody who is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the kind of person who will give his two-year-old $5,000 to donate to his campaign, um, I feel like that's a circumstance where, um, you know, the party has a vested interest in speaking out publicly on something like that. Um, and also, I just realized that I jumped over the um, campaign finance piece. Oh, yeah. can, I, can I circle back to that? Yeah. So um, the reason why we support the reason why we support the unlimited transfers between um, statewide candidates and the party is because that's already federal law, right? A candidate for uh, U.S. Or in the example given by Paul Burns from VPIRG yesterday, a retiring U.S. senator wanted to um, give a million dollars to a state party. I would weep openly, publicly, if they wanted to do that, because I could really use a million dollars. Um, but also, there is nothing in federal law preventing that from happening. Whereas a uh, statewide candidate for Secretary of State, Attorney General, Lieutenant Governor, wants to um, donate, wants to give us money, they are capped at the $10,000 contribution limit. And where we ran into some problems with that last year is um, with our um, voter contact service, um, our, the, the fee for that is $10,000. Uh, for statewide candidates. And there is some dispute amongst the legal minds that advise us through this process as to whether or not that is a good in service with marketable value that does not get counted towards contribution limits or whether it is a contribution. So um, we are supportive of <coughs> expanding that donation limit uh, so that we don't run into those kind of logistical issues. Uh, one tiny suggestion on the language is maybe we want to change it from candidate to candidate committee um, so that there is an added, added layer, right? So, you know, a multi-millionaire uh, multi self-funded candidate running for uh, attorney general has to at least put the money into their own committee before it gets to the party. That adds a layer of disclosure mm -hmm. to the process to make sure that it, it is public and open. Yeah. I'll We'll talk to Ledge Council about whether there is a, a real distinction given the definition of candidate in yep. that section of the law, but I think that's a good flag that what we really are talking about when we talk about a candidate there is their committee. There, there, isn't, there isn't really even a distinction, I don't think, between um, the individual and their committee at that, yeah. you know, once you're getting into the candidate yeah. finance. I, I, I will obviously defer to Council on that. They're, they're the minds that understand this stuff better than I do, but what, what, we're, trying, what we're really trying to get at here is to make sure that we can provide all of the services that we want to provide to candidates running under the Democratic banner um, while making sure that we're fairly compensated for that work. So just to be clear, with the, the way it is today, if, if you, know, you have a candidate who is running for any of those statewide offices, lieutenant governor, treasurer, or attorney general, mm -hmm. the, just their buying access to the statewide voter system, the uh, data system that the par your party runs, our party runs, would potentially put them over the top. There is some disagreement amongst the people that are advising us as to whether whether or not that would put them over the top and making it aligning state campaign finance law with federal campaign finance law would eliminate that confusion. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Dando? I'm available. You guys all know how to find me. Thank you, Thank you so much. much for joining us today, Jim. Happy good to see you. You too. All right. Don't know if we have our folks who um, had asked for some time to talk about the emergent media program. <laughs> Here. Sorry, don't know everybody by. Uh, well, we're running a few minutes early, so uh, if you are ready to go, uh, Robin and Sarah. Yes. Um, yeah, do you, uh, we can pull up an extra chair for you. Uh, oh, thank you, Representative Murphy. And um, is there a way to plug in a slide deck or? Um, so what we typically do is have folks share that with our committee assistant, and we look at stuff on our devices so that folks can see it's just on Zoom. Do you have the ability to, to email that to us? Um, that'd be great.
Before we jump to the next subject, I sure. tell the news that I'm dead this afternoon for being something that was true. That's not true. Let's not do that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, go, go ahead. I'm senior certified, so you know what was it like. Go ahead, Representative Cooper. The only one that has. Uh, I, I am just fundamentally opposed to doing anything that would alter the ballot. It sounds like putting a designation on the ballot of somebody that's endorsed by the party is equivalent to putting a needed Joe's sign on there. And the ballot would be, I think, preserved pretty much as, as nonpartisan as possible. Yeah, the only thing, um, so I, I know Representative Byron brought up the suggestion that Mr. Dan brought up yesterday. Yeah. That is not on the table, uh, but I thought that it was interesting to hear that uh, Mr. Dandino had a different opinion on that particular issue. I think that's what you're addressing it is. specifically. Yes. Yeah. You know, often amazing to me how sometimes in the heat of discussion, things that aren't on the table end up on the table. Yeah, I, I, I would say uh, I would not be in favor of that kind of a system like Connecticut has either. Um, I, we are going to hear later this morning um, from the Franklin County Dems chair because I, there's a specific example uh, from the last primary that I think would be important for the committee to know and it's primarily why I'm so interested in um, this cross-party nomination question. Um, so um, it gets at the, what we have today uh, putting having a totally open filing and a totally open primary system leads to some shenanigans that I think confuse voters. That's my main thing. It's about, it's about being clear to voters about who this candidate is and which party they're affiliated with. And why I think it really is possible for, for folks to um, get multiple endorsements from parties, and there's nothing in the bill as it's presented that would preclude that, where we're in a situation where um, a very small number of votes can lead to us printing a party's endorsement of a candidate on the ballot today that I think is uh, misleading to voters. And we're, we're going to hear about one example. So, so I think you're, you're getting at the values of wanting to like kind of keep the partisanship off the ballot. Uh, I think we're, if, if we proceeded with the cross-party nomination language that's in the draft language, we are narrowing that to just saying, you know, you pick one lane, you stay in your lane, and that's that. But I also want to say that I think as we move in that direction, we also have to recognize that we might very well be moving closer to ranked choice voting as opposed to three-way races all over the place that give us candidates that basically have 35, 40% of the vote being seated, which effectively is 60% of the people saying, I don't want it. Just as a... Yeah, and so, so that's where the, inter, the interplay between the two sections of the bill comes in. Yeah, we should talk more about, about whether it would have that effect or not. Uh, Representative Hingo. Yeah, I don't want to take away from time from Champlain College, but this brings up, a, it, it's re now really muddy for me. I have no idea what we're trying to do with the bill because you're proposing to not have any parties written after anybody's name on the ballot. No. I think, I think Representative Hooper was just rejecting the suggestion that Mr. Dane made yesterday about having a post-primary sort of, this is a real endorsement versus yep. just just a, you won, in the, you won sure. by the voters, okay. yeah. <laughs> On the ballot, but you can seal the can, approval all you want. Yeah, There's not party, on the ballot. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and you're proposing that there be a certain number of signatures required to um, have dual party. No, it's in the language that we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. Is that you get one. You just get one. You can only have one. That's what's in that language that we've looked at. And so that, I, yeah, that, that's that's going to be the crux of a lot of the testimony we're going to hear later this morning. Is about that specific. Um, you've got to pick which party's endorsement you want. Okay, because I thought I heard you say something just now, something about the number that, that there are very few number would 
get you a dual party. That's how it is today. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how it is today. That's, so that's it's the I'm today versus what I have in the bill. I what I have in the bill eliminates the confusion. <laughs> yes, but also eliminates a lot of other opportunities for people. Which we'll get into. Yep. Conversation. Sorry to take that's okay. No, no, no. We're uh, I we're switching gears. We're going to push pause on our <laughs> yes, elections very, bill that we've been discussing. This is much more. This is much less. Uh, <laughs> 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 hopefully, hopefully. I don't know. Famous list. We shouldn't set the bar too high. So, um, so would you, um, Rob and Sarah, please introduce yourselves yes. and uh, tell us why you're here today? And thank you for joining us. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, my name is Robin Perla, and this is my colleague, Sarah Jerger. Um, we're both here from Champlain College to talk to you about um, Champlain College's uh, impact on the creative sector and um, in support of the creative network who's here today for the um, Creative Advocacy Day. So um, I did send um, a PDF slide deck. It's mostly just pretty pictures, so um, you know I won't kind of give you the sign as to the ding as to when to move slides, but um, the, um, they just are <coughs> images to support what we're going to talk to you about, um, which is Champlain College and our role is, um, currently and in, in the future as a driver of innovation and creativity in Vermont. For those of you who don't know, Champlain is a small professionally focused private college in Burlington with approximately 1,800 students in our traditional residential undergraduate programs. We also have a robust uh, online program, which we're not going to talk about today, um, that draws from all over the country. Um, and today, what we want to talk to you about is our um, academic programs and our experiential learning opportunities that feed the Vermont creative economy. Um, I, I, mean, I guess I'll just introduce you. Okay, go ahead. Um, Sarah's going to talk about uh, the Emergent Media Center. She's the director of the Emergent Media Center, um, has been at Champlain College for 15 years is also an artist in her own right. If any of you are from Chittenden County, she operates a free uh, art gallery in Essex Junction in her um, front yard that has seen over 800 pieces of tiny art exchanged in its first year, so it's a community um, effort. And then I'm the assistant dean of the Creative Studio, which oversees our art design and communication programs. I'm also an associate professor in the graphic design program. I also um, am the former vice chair of the Vermont Arts Council, it's for the trustee trustees and have had a 20-year career intersecting art technology and education. So um, so anyways, we're going to talk, um, first I'll talk to you a little bit about our academic programs. Um, we have two um, studios, which are sort of these academic um, units that encompass um, our arts, media, and technology. The first one is the creative studio. Um, so the goal of the Creative Studio is to prepare our students for interdisciplinary creative careers and to support collaboration both in classes and in their extracurricular activities between students, faculty, and creative industries. Um, the ease with which students can take courses in other creative majors is a differentiating factor for Champlain, as is the number of minors we have that share courses across majors, if those of you who have college-age students, you know that some of the larger schools, it becomes very difficult if you want to do something that's kind of not in the college that you've enrolled in. With art colleges, they tend to be quite siloed by discipline. And Champlain is, because we're small and because we're not an art college, we really have the flexibility to allow our students to, um, to become sort of Swiss Army knives of creative endeavors and professional careers, um, which serves them really well especially as they start looking for jobs. Um, our current majors include, it's a laundry list, but animation, broadcast, communication, creative media, filmmaking, graphic design, et cetera, et cetera. You can look at the list on your deck. Um, but many of our students go on to have careers in the creative sector in, in Vermont. Many of our students um, were born and raised in Vermont and want to stay here, but also many of them come to Vermont for the skiing and stay for the community, right? So there's, on the slide deck, you'll see a very, um, just a, a surface look at some of the um, create the jobs in the creative sector that our creative students, studios, creative studio students are involved in, including City of Burlington, On Logic, Seventh Generation, Stowe, North Country Bank, Burton, Dealer.com, Scout Digital, 1% for the Planet, Sugarbush, Tata Harper, and many, many more. That was a five-minute search on my LinkedIn. That's how I came up with that list. Um, 
And then we also have a really unique program that um, is really what sort of made Champlain's name in the country as an institution, which is our game studio. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, you'd be surprised actually if the demographic of games is not what you think. Actually, women are the largest, um, middle-aged women are the largest sector in the gaming industry. That being said, I'm guessing most of you are not playing console AAA games, like, um, I don't know, I can't even think of one because I don't really play them myself. <laughs> but anyway, Fortnite. 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 Um, but it is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry, encompassing traditional entertainment sectors such as Blizzard and Ubisoft, but also includes other things that you may not think of serious games, um, like Alkili, the first company with an FDA-approved prescription game treatment for juvenile ADHD. Um, sur- uh, simulations for the military or aviation and aeronautics complex. It's also used um, VR, I'm sure maybe some of you have heard, has been used extensively in the treatment of PTSD and other serious psychological issues, you know, um, uh, uh, mental health issues. Um, gamification is also used in marketing and PR, which we all know, unfortunately, we've all <laughs> been subject to um, you know, marketing's <coughs> attempt at gamifying things. Um, so the game studio um, again is a multidisciplinary program. We have we draw from multiple divisions, um, and they work together uh, throughout their four years at the college to make games. Um, the game studio graduates, however, unlike the creative studio graduates, the game studio gradu- graduates often leave Burlington um, to find employment. Which, when you look at the list of employments on the employers on the slide deck, you'll see it's much shorter than the creative studio list. That being said, we've had notable success with companies such as Game Theory, Rad Magpie, and Sunday Month, all launched in Burlington by Champlain graduates. Game Theory Co. is a woman-led organization. It began began as an entertainment game company, but as it transitioned into the serious and educational game space, partnering with organizations to create games for education and research. Rad Magpie, also women and non-binary led, is a 501c3 nonprofit doing its part, this is their mission, to dismantle the patriarchy and white supremacy through uplifting underrepresented video game developers, which they accomplish through education and game production. Sunday Month is also an indie game developer, which emerged from a, their, their actual their senior capstone project. One thing I want to note as we think about um, games in Vermont and retaining these graduates in the state is that it's also been interesting for me to note that as with many other tech industries, remote work for games has exploded since the pandemic. And a quick look through my LinkedIn, um, how I do all my research, (laughs) um, confirmed for me that many of our recent game studio graduates are living in Burlington while working remotely um, across the country for AAA game companies. Montreal is less than two hours from Burlington, has a thriving game industry. And with our Champlain College graduates interested in staying put to work remotely, there's so much opportunity to engage and harness that creative spirit and expand on the slowly emerging indie game industry here in Vermont. Um, so, you know, as I, you know, as I talked about, sort of as I was talking about these different programs, um, a huge part of this professionally focused education at Champlain College is this interdisciplinary approach and this experiential approach where students are um, working together on project-based learning, having real-world experiences in the community. And one of the linchpins of how we do that at Champlain is our um, uh, centers of experience. One you may have heard of is the Leahy Center for Digital Forensics and Cybersecurity. Um, another, one of our, uh, that's one of our kind of most successful um, centers of experience, but our other most successful <laughs> center for experience is the Emergent Media Center, um, which is what uh, Sarah's going to talk to us about. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so the Emergent Media Center, we were founded back in 2006, and since then we have employed over a thousand students and completed over a hundred projects partnering with over 60 clients. Um, some of those are very familiar Vermont organizations, such as UVM College of Medicine, ECHO down at the lakefront, um, Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, the airport, Vermont Teddy Bear, King Street Center, OVR Technology, if you've heard of them, they're based at Hula. And so the EMC is a creative studio primarily focused on applied research and experimentation. 
So we're using novel applications of emerging technologies, immersive media, and human-centered design processes to design creative solutions brought to us by community partners. So these applied research areas may include things like serious games, which Robin had mentioned, and simulation, embodied systems, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, all the, re all the realities, oh, yeah. mobile apps, um, assistive and adaptive technologies, physical computing, just to name a few. There's, there's just so much that, that we can do. Um, research and development areas are really determined by the grant opportunities or other sponsorship opportunities as well as originating from different faculty interest areas and their expertise. So in addition to doing that technological exploration, we are always looking at how we can address the, the wicked problems, if you're familiar with that phrase, in a design for good model. How can we use media, technology, and design to do good things in the world and cause positive impact? Um, so we might be looking at research areas determined by the technology itself, or we might be looking at the societal problem needing creative solutions. So the work that we do falls into three categories. We have studio projects at the EMC, we have our Champlain Maker program, which is in partnership with Generator, and we do design thinking consultation services for companies. So we are student driven. We offer paid professional experiences for our students from all majors across the college. Um, they conceptualize, prototype, and produce that wide range of media which I talked about to solve those problems. And when we say emergent, we're talking about new and up and coming technologies, but also using existing technologies in really new and interesting ways. So. Um, the, the teams consist of, of students with both technical and creative skills. They're working really collaboratively together to explore and produce this really cool cutting edge work, like the work of the future, the work that we need. And they're applying, enhancing, and expanding on what they're learning in the classroom and practicing it with a real world project in a very cross-disciplinary way like they will in the professional workplace. So it's a paid job outside of their academics and it's a stepping stone for them out into the professional workplace. Um, for our partners, who we call our clients, they are getting the creative and beginner's minds of these students and their technical know-how to solve some of these really big challenges. And we offer our reassurance to both our partners and our students that all of the work is supported by our team of professional staff and faculty. We don't just throw the students out there to go willy-nilly and do what they want. They have this guidance and support. So a couple of examples, which I'll just highlight for you, um, of, a, of a long list of examples. You won't be able to see the, the moving GIFs on these screens, but um, a couple of recent projects that we worked on were with Beta Technologies and with Vermont Symphony Orchestra. I'm sure we're all likely familiar with Beta, the renowned electro-aerospace manufacturer here. So their cutting edge technology is really incredible, and it can also be very hard for people to understand if they're not familiar with the science and engineering behind it. So to help ease this challenge, we partnered with Beta and our students created an animated game prototype to really help visitors to Beta learn how their aircraft works in a, in a very accessible way. Um, we also just recently completed year one of a three-year partnership with the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. In an effort to appeal to younger audiences, VSO came to us and wanted our students to create a visual media experience that would enhance and accompany the orchestra performances. And so um, this year, our students created short experimental films, which were projected um, behind the um, Vermont Symphony and Vermont Youth Orchestras at the Flynn. And next year, we're going to be um, working on motion graphics and projection mapping that will break outside of the rectangular box of the screen and look at putting projections onto architectural elements inside um, the Flynn. Perfect. Um, so, um, Awesome stuff happening at Champlain. Um, we're also um, working, we've just established our, 2020, our 2030 strategic plan. We have a new president. Um, we're working closely with Burlington on the plans for the innovation hub in the South End with the Champlain connector, kind of dumping right onto Lakeside Avenue, which is where we have our small Lakeside campus, which is where the Emerging Media Center is. So we're looking at what's next and how to grow um, these relationships both um, to expand our, our creative um, uh, degree offerings and then also to continue to expand our partnerships with um, the creative 
community in Burlington and throughout Vermont. So um, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, did, I know we're sort of at time, but if anybody has any quick questions. Yeah, yeah, happy um, to those Morgan yeah, yeah, please. I hope these are, I think these are relatively quick. The, um, two things, please. Um, so my daughter and son-in-law are graduates of Linden State College. Mm. I know that they would take my head if they heard me call it Northern Vermont University at Linden. But, uh, <laughs> but it is. Correct. Um, <laughs> But uh, they both, um, he was in the weather arena and she was in the animation arena. Do you all partner with them in any way? Because I like seeing the yeah. smaller schools having that, that yeah. impact, you know what I mean? Is that, I just curious if you yeah, so, um, on some level. We have in the past, like we've done, um, you know, the, the, in the creative studio we'll have portfolio days that are open to all college students from, mm -hmm. um, is, you know, from, from Vermont, and we would get a lot from NDU as well as from Champlain and UVM. Um, we also look at, um, through, through grants, a lot of the NSF grants, the larger grants are um, require collaboration, especially when you're looking at sort of grants that are geared toward rural um, communities. Um, so the like, F-score grants, those require collaboration between different institutions. I don't know that, you know, and we're in, the college is in a F-score process being run by UVM, um, uh, the application process, and so we've got several small colleges, um, but I don't know that one of them is NVU. But I love yeah. that, I, and I, I mean, I think it's a, great, it's, I mean, a, it's, a, it's a great curiosity, and it's something certainly. I get on some yeah. of your competitors, there's no question, well, not hardcore, but you know, yeah. and, and it's too I'm small just kind of too. curious, because I, yeah. like I said, I'm a big fan of the small colleges, what they do for students yes. in the state of Vermont. Yes, and, and, I'd love, and we'd, I think we'd all love to see NVU stay here oh, and be, success, I, you know, I be successful, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that. And that's um, too, I mean, it's a hard, you know, the, you know, the, you know, as you may or may not know, um, you know, there's been a population cliff um, in the Northeast, and so yeah. we've seen a lot of colleges closing over the yeah. past, you know, five years, yeah. and there will be more. Um, and so we have to really yeah, think creatively sure. as to how we can stay relevant sure. and vital. And my second thing, real quick, was um, I don't think you touched on it, but the, and it may not be your piece of the five, but yeah. the forensic lab that they have, mm -hmm. that you all have at Champlain. Yeah. I, I'm retired from the guard. I know we use them for reasons I can't get into, but sure. you're probably yes. aware of some of those things. But, yeah. um, uh, is that, do you all touch on that at all with any of your? Works or we, um, I mean, we, we share um, some administ we have some administrative supports, and mm -hmm. so we kind of work as colleagues and collaborators in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but our, our missions are quite More different. This creative stuff. Yes. yes, and yes. so, and then again, this, um, you know, we were invited to come here as part of the Vermont Creative Network to really think about the, yeah. um, the impact of, of, of Champlain on the creative sector. Sure. Um, and then, okay. arguably, I mean, I guess cybersecurity is actually pretty creative in terms of yeah. <laughs> here. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's the, the problem solving, but maybe not as visually yeah, that's, appealing. I mean, <laughs> well, it's an area I don't think a lot of people realize that you yeah. all have, it's very, it's actually yes. a very robust program it considering is. the size of the school that exists mm -hmm. yes. on a national level, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, and that's a major part of our strategic mm -hmm. plan moving forward. Thank together. you. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here today. You, yeah. um, I think you particularly landed here and um, some of the advocates you're working with because of our um, jurisdictional uh, interest in inf information technology, and yeah. it's good to know about these resources that are kind of on the <laughs> way out on the bleeding edge of some of the, the creative work. Um, yes, for sure, and especially, leadership. like, hey, to that end, um, you know, I didn't get have quite enough time to go into detail about some of our plans um, in kind of this innovation hub that's sort of bubbling up in, in the south end of Vermont. But keep an eye on that as we think about sort of these new technologies, um, you know, in terms of immersive media. Um, our hope is to be able to put a major investment in that area in the next few years. So uh, yeah. I had whispered to Representative Byron only half jokingly uh, when you were talking about the, the beta um, software that you had developed um, about doing a field trip, so we, yes, uh, yes. we'll be in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good field Thank today. you very much. And I will leave this is um, some information for you guys about um, the Vermont Creative Network and um, the work they're doing. I can leave this here for you, and also they're in the card room all day. If you have other questions um, for them, they'd love to have you come Representative sit. Hango before Rob. That's here. okay. Yeah. This question is for oh, you. Oh, it's for me. <laughs> Thank, yes. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. So, how does this fit into our portfolio? So uh, we have been asked since IT generally, uh, and there are 
people who are visiting the state house on different days where it doesn't fit into the specific bills and policy work that we're doing right now, but I got a request to give a little bit of time to folks who are visiting the state house and our committee to tell us about what they're doing, and so I was Okay, so being similar generous. to like um, somebody else is coming in, rights and democracy is coming in to now, do yes. the same thing. Okay. Exactly. All so right, this is a little it. bit of a pause uh, okay. for this hour-ish. Um, from our work specifically on the bills that we have to welcome people who are visiting the state house today to tell us about their priorities. So gotcha. sorry, I didn't. Thank if you. I didn't frame that up well, we are kind of going on going on a couple of tangents here because folks happen to be in the state house today. Great, thank you. Great. Um, so with that, I would like to invite up um, uh, folks from Rad. I believe Tom Proctor, you're uh, you're leading uh, the delegation today, and yeah, so um, we'll we'll take about 15 minutes with you all, take a break, and then get back on testimony about our elections bill. Well, thank you, Chairman McCarthy, and members of House GovOps Committee, welcome to welcome you all today. Uh, my name is Tom Proctor. I'm the Housing Justice Organizer for Rights and Democracy in Vermont. Before I begin, I wish to share land acknowledgement with the committee. Uh, Rights and Democracy acknowledges the Mohegan in Southern Vermont and Abenaki people as traditional land caretakers in Endonica, which includes parts of Vermont, New Hampshire, New England, and Quebec as guests on unceded territory of the Mohegan and Abenaki people. We honor their ancestors, elders, and relations past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that our nation has benefited from the uncompensated and exploited labor represented in the legacy of slavery and the present day reality of migrant farm workers. Thank you. Rights and Democracy, which we call RAD for short, and our sibling organization, the Rights and Democracy Institute, were founded in 2015 on the theory of change that takes people power year after year to make the kind of big, bold, long-term changes we want to see in this country. Our members are from all walks of life, intergenerational, multicultural, activists, organizers, but most importantly, passionate fighters for true social justice and meaningful change in our communities and across the state. Our current systems are rooted in historic oppressions, deeply dysfunctional and fragile. When those fragile systems break, Vermonters who have been systemically kept out of place for power are those most impacted. Abnaki and indigenous persons, racial and ethnic minority, ethnic minorities, LGBTQIA individuals, individuals with disabilities, senior citizens, new Americans, youth, poor, are the people who carry the weight of the policies and the systems gone wrong. These individuals are nearly 80% of the Vermont voting population and are the least represented in our state government and are in some cases wholly invisible to those who enact policies. Our mission is to bring people together to take action, to build healthy communities and make the values of our communities guide the policies of our government. We believe we can achieve a society where people earn a living wage and have access to affordable health care, where a progressive and equitable tax system supports an economy that protects the environment and human rights. It is our pleasure to testify to you today and share the vision for more just and vibrant Vermont. I'll kick off by sharing with uh, you with our 2023 platform. Vermont must do its part to ensure a just transition to a clean energy future that mandates renewable energy and ends a reliance on dirty, polluting fossil fuels. And we must guarantee that everybody's benefits, especially Vermonters, have been most impacted by past and current harms. That's why this year we're supporting the passage of S5, the Affordable Heat Act, while still calling, calling for greater equity provisions within the bill. We are also supporting efforts to reform renewable energy standard and ensure that Vermont can get to 30% state renewable energy and 30% regional renewable energy in the next decade. And state renewable energy is the key to our state resiliency and helps rebuild the green economy that Vermont communities need and doesn't shift the climate version burden of our energy use to other states. We are also supporting H56, the Ratepayer Protection and Thermal Energy Network Act. This bill in House Environment and Energy would extend electric ratepayer protections to more Vermonters, adds a proven solution to Vermont's energy choices by creating a pathway for geothermal and moves Vermont away from combusting fuels by prohibiting gas expansion and new service territories. Okay, my part. Vermont is in a housing crisis, so we all know this. This means there isn't enough affordable housing for Vermont's, Vermonters, and many Vermonters are forced to live in expensive, unsafe places. Tenants who bring concerns about their living conditions to the landlord also have to worry about eviction and homelessness. We need housing for all. That is why we need to work both on creating new affordable housing like provisions in the Senate Housing Omnibus Bill, and we also need to protect tenants' rights, and in fact, create new tenants' rights. The Housing Omnibus Bill includes many needed zoning 
uh, Act 250 and housing discrimination changes that we support and hope that the bill will pass the House and Senate. To meet the needs of tenants in Vermont, we must also pass statewide just cause eviction. Municipal just cause eviction charter changes that have been Democrat and municipal just cause eviction charter changes that have been democratically approved by local voters and will come to this committee when we pass in those local areas. Election diversion programs and cap the amount of rent increases that tenants have to bear. Last year, the legislature passed Burlington's city charter change for just cause eviction, but the governor vetoed the bill. We need to build off that 99 votes that the House got in a veto override and pass that bill this year. We also need to act swiftly on any further JCE charter changes that make their way to this committee this year. Thousands of Vermont tenants are counting on you to grant them the tenant protections they have specifically voted for. We also need to ensure that Vermont has all the data it needs to accurately track our rental market, including where the units are, who owns them, the accountability of the unit, unit and other pertinent information. Without this basic information, we'll always be behind on understanding the true rental crisis and, its limit, and it limits our ability to take action for Vermont renters. To achieve a food system in Vermont, we must create equitable access to land, farming and food. We are glad to see the passage of universal school meals in 2022, but it's time to find a permanent funding solution to ensure that all Vermont's children get, get the healthy meals they need without the stigma. The Land Access Opportunity Board is an equity board created by the legislature in the last biennium and is housed in the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. In the coming weeks, this board will release a report and recommendations the legislature should consider and take action on. But what we need to do now, what we need to know now is that the board will need continued funding to do its work. That means fiscal year 2024 budget adjustment of $1 million. This will also allow the board to formalize its procedures and set itself up for long-term work that, need, that is needed in creating greater access and opportunities for those Vermonters that have been historically left out. Workers in Vermont retail, restaurant, agriculture, and other service industries play deeply vital roles in our community, yet these workers are often underpaid and underprotected in their workplaces. To thrive, all workers need a fair and dignified wages, full benefits, and strong legal protections. The sub-minimum wage, a direct legacy of slavery, particularly impact women and the disproportionately women of colour. It is time to end the sub-minimum wage and pass one fair wage for all Vermonters. We also need to pass the VT Pro Act that strengthens workers' rights. When it comes to public education, we have a long way to go to make all Vermont schools equitable and welcoming to all students. We need to remove police from schools, make anti-discrimination policies that are more accessible and develop education funding system that is equitable as possible by implementing the recommendations of the Income-Based Education Tax Study Committee. Vermont is also known as a leader for voting rights and democracy, and we need to continue that leadership by implementing a system of ranked choice voting for the presidential primaries and then for all elections. Ranked choice voting gives more access to more candidates and gives voters real choice to the ballot box. We must also create a state legislature that everyone can take part in. This means greatly increasing the salary and benefits for our state legisl legislators and also the per diems for those appointed to state boards and committees. The last crisis I will speak to is certainly isn't the least, the overdose crisis. Vermont has become a leader in the deadliness of the overdose crisis. The legislature last year passed many important provisions that were undone by governor's veto. This year we must pass permanent buprenorphine decriminalization for personal use, create overdose prevention sites, make accessible community-based syringe services to all Vermonters, create a mobile methadone clinic pilot program, and expand treatment education for first responders. This means supporting H72 and H222. It is important we lift the voices of people. Today I'm joined by some of our amazing leaders. Today two dozen individuals are speaking their truths in a committee throughout the legislature. So joining me are rights and democracy supporters and allies, Anne Zimmerman to speak on her efforts organizing around the Brassel Bureau just cause eviction, Madeline Heller to speak on her experience engaging with tenants across Vermont, and Bridget Mienka to speak on her eviction experience and the effort she's contributed towards the Winooski Just Cause Vision campaign. The first speaker today is Anne. So I just want to frame things up. Welcome. Please please take the witness chair. I, um, we have very limited time this morning because we're working on a number of bills. So I just wanted to make sure, um, since we've We've budgeted 15 minutes for this, that, that we, if, if everybody can kind of take a couple minutes and introduce these ideas to us, we really do want to hear from folks. I also have to give the committee a break, and we have the lieutenant governor coming in at, at 1015. So once we get into some of these issues, happy to have folks back if, if we're taking up bills on these matters. So sorry to, that we're crunched for time this morning. Sorry. So I'm Ann Zimmerman, as Tom said. Um, I live down in Guilford, which is in the Brattleboro area. And for context, I am a renter. 
I am someone who raised two kids in the Southern Vermont rental housing market as a low-income single parent, and housing was, during the time I was raising my kids, the single biggest stressor in my life, and to a pretty good extent continues to be, even though my kids are grown and no longer dependents. Um, and I'm pretty sure you're well aware that we are in a housing crisis, uh, particularly in the rental market, so I don't, I'm not trying to drive that particular point home. I'm here to speak about why we need to end no cause eviction and make just cause eviction into the law. And at the very least, this body needs to approve local charter changes where they are passed by the voters, as might will happen in Brattleboro. Um, I want to put a human face on the crisis of no cause eviction by speaking to the situation down in the Brattleboro market. Um, my friend Damaris and a group of her fellow tenants who reside or recently resided at a housing complex in West Brattleboro known as Westbrook Court, you may have read about. There's been some recent coverage, but I don't believe it's unique by any means. Damaris and a few of her neighbors, whom I've gotten to know recently, had created a community of neighbors who gardened and barbecued together and who generally looked out for each other, especially since a number of them had disabilities and were aging or had other life challenges. Um, they had created a pretty nice situation and felt as though they were good tenants who paid their rent and didn't cause any trouble. And last October, Damaris and at least a dozen, possibly as many as 20 residents of Westbrook Court received notices that their leases would not be renewed. No cause was given and they had either 60 or 90 days to move out and were supposed to move out in the middle of winter, no less. Um, the majority of those who got the notice of lease non-renewal were handicapped in some way, are elderly or low income, and a common thread seems to be that most, if not all, were on some kind of housing assistance. The complex had been sold recently to a private equity corporation, and it seems the new owners didn't want to deal with any of that. Um, others in the complex who were offered a new lease saw their rent go up exorbitantly and also had to cough up more money for a new um, deposit, to, you know, higher deposit. And of course, that caused immediate distress uh, because of the extreme difficulty of finding housing right now in the Brattleboro area, let alone anything affordable. Um, just for example, Damaris's neighbor Matt, who um, needs to be in a handicap accessible unit, is facing major surgery that will put him in a wheelchair. He's been not uh, put off a bunch of times because of COVID and he can barely walk at the moment, so let alone pick up and move. Another former neighbor is a single mother with a daughter in high school and she was unable to find housing nearby, so she was forced to take something in Keene, New Hampshire, while her daughter stayed behind in his couch surfing so she can finish the school year. Um, so I don't actually have a hard time imagining that situation being replicated around town. I think that it probably happens in a number of families. So this is breaking up a community as well as separating a family. The Maris herself is in her 70s and has Parkinson's. Uh, she also needs a first floor unit and she was forced to stop working during the pandemic because of her added vulnerability. And what I know that she would like you to know, she said very specifically to me, um, she wants you to know how much trauma comes from finding out you have 60 or 90 days to move while trying to survive on a low income in this housing market. There is pretty much nowhere to go. So I realize that you don't govern by anecdote. Um, there are so many stories from down where I live that it's important to me that these people are real to you. A, a pretty good friend of mine um, has been couch surfing for months when she was told she needed to vacate her apartment um, because it was for sale. Um, so she vacated her apartment, and um, rather than the building being sold, another tenant moved in paying higher rent. And you know, at least she doesn't have kids. But I remember when selling a building, you know, it was a selling point if the building was fully rented to tenants. Um, and that is no longer true. People are told that they have to move just so that the rent can be jacked up by the new owners, or maybe even by the same owner because, oh, by the way, they didn't sell it after all. Um, and I'll just add that I realize that all of these folks are victims of a housing crisis that is driven by a lot of forces, uh, some of which need more sweeping solutions, and no one who is advocating for just cause eviction thinks that this basic tenant protection is any kind of panacea for all of our housing problems. But this is something that can be done to alleviate some of the considerable stress of folks who are otherwise in a precarious housing situation, which renting is almost by definition, and give more stability to families and communities. And I have certainly felt that acute stress myself, worrying about not being able to find a place to live. And if you have never experienced that particular terror as a, as a parent, I assure you there is nothing quite like this. Um, so to me, here is the crux of the matter. One of the vacated apartments in Westbrook that had been rented for 1050 
I recently saw advertised for 1700 It's very modest, there's nothing special. And that is out of range of someone receiving housing assistance. So you can see why the new corporate owner would want to remove the people in order to jack up the rent. Most people I know could not afford that rent. It is out of step with the reality of local wages, although perhaps it may seem more normal for people who are moving into the area from other markets. Um, and these are also apartments that are um, in need of repair. Um, you know, they don't seem to be happening, those repairs. It would appear that the goal is to make a lot of money very quickly, not to invest in long-term quality housing. Just cause eviction would pr protect renters in places like that who pay their rent and haven't done anything wrong from having to be in a constant state of worry over losing their housing. And we will all be better for that <laughs> when, um, you know, there's less constant turnover. Um, and I will just finish by saying that I have listened to argument after argument from some of the smaller landlords who aren't part of that new corporate model who complain that this is the only way they can remove the quote unquote problem tenants. Um, they insist that they only want to get rid of the bad ones and should not have to renew a lease to destructive or dirty tenants or maybe even the other tenants are complaining about them. And I, I would say I don't have time to speak to everything that's wrong with that assumption. But I would submit that there is a system of checks and balances in place whereby those committing violations of health and safety, excessive noise, illegal activity, non-payment of rent, or other lease violations can be removed. And when there is an inherent imbalance in the power relationship as there is between landlord and tenant, the haves and have-nots, if you will, um, it involves something as basic as keeping a roof over one's head. We absolutely need to keep to that system of checks and balances rather than maintain the shortcut that is no cause eviction. So I'm asking you that if you believe that housing is a human right, and I hope that we agree that housing is a human right, that you will legislate in support of just cause eviction. And thank you so much for your time and letting me go on. Thanks for okay. being here today. Thank you. Um, would you like Madeline to go? Madeline, not be great, yeah. Madeline, I think you're with us via Zoom. We're running a little over, so I just want to uh, try to keep the comments brief. And as we, and then, like I said, as we dig into specific issues as they come before us, I'm happy to have folks back. Good morning, Chair McCarthy. Um, I will try to keep this brief. And thank you all for having us today and listening to these stories. Um, as mentioned, I'm Madeline Hiller. I'm a resident of Woodstock, and I'm currently a senior environmental policy major at Middlebury College. This past semester, I had the opportunity to work with RAD to combat the split incentive issue by creating a policy proposal that would incentivize Vermont landlords to weatherize their units with no further financial burden on tenants. <laughs> However, while doing this research, uh, my peers and I realized that there are two key steps that must be taken before implementing a weatherization policy. And so first, we really need to pass a statewide rental registry and a just cause eviction standard, as Anne mentioned. Establishing the rental registry is important because it creates built-in accountability for property managers and landlords, plus gives lawmakers such as yourselves better insight into the reality of the housing crisis in Vermont. And the just cause eviction standard protects tenants from unfair and retaliatory evictions as it requires landlords and property managers to have a legally allowable reason to evict tenants. Additionally, just cause eviction measures also protect good landlords from bad tenants. So with just cause eviction, landlords can still evict for non-payment, branch of le breach of lease, or breaking of tenant obligations. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that you all be receiving any just cause eviction charter changes that pass in March. Um, as Tom mentioned, and we'll also be working with the Burlington Just Cause Eviction Charter Change in the near future. Um, so without tenant protections, almost 30% of Vermonters live in fear that at any moment their landlord can arbitrarily evict them. And Just Cause Eviction Standards will allow tenants not to be fearful to report code violations or landlord harassment because they know that they will be able to stay in their home and not be evicted at the end of their lease. Um, I recently had the privilege to speak with a tenant in the Burlington area who had to couch surf for one year and after being forced to move from their home and live day to day, not knowing where they may sleep the next day, this tenant felt very stressed and disorganized. 
She felt that she could not be fully present at her job, could not focus on her relationships and did not have time to take care of herself. Um, when she ultimately found an apartment, she was afraid of pushing too hard for the property manager to do the right thing because she did not want to be evicted for simply asking for an infrastructure or utility fix. Um, she also felt uncomfortable addressing these issues out of fear of experiencing the anxieties that couch surfing had added to her life the previous year. So for other tenants experiencing the same reality, unjust evictions could lead them to losing their jobs, leaving their community, splitting up their family, moving to a different state, or even becoming homeless. And the desperation of needing a roof over your head should not override having a quality living situation. Having a quality living situation should be and is a fundamental human right. And with just cause eviction standards, tenants will not have to fear the power dynamic between themselves and their landlord. Instead, they will be empowered to advocate for themselves and address whatever issues there may be with their living situation. Finally, I'd like to finish up with a story, uh, a recent eviction that happened in Brattleboro. Just two weeks ago, a resident of Brattleboro and her family were evicted from their home. And this was during that cold snap that we had with negative 30 degree wind chills. Um, so the landlord had shown up unannounced in 2022 um, to the home and decided that the house was too messy and that the tenants were not abiding by the contract. Um, so in Vermont, a landlord must give 48 hours notice before going to inspect a property. And this landlord decided to evict the family after she broke the law by arriving to inspect this house without prior notice. So when they got the, evic the eviction notice, the tenant immediately began searching for housing and had been looking since August of 2022. However, due to the lack of affordable housing for families in the Brattleboro area, they could not find anything that would accommodate them. So the tenant, her husband, and their children who are seven and three years old are now living in a motel until they can secure another place to live. Um, throughout the eviction process, her only hope has been to have a roof over her head, somewhere she can properly raise her children and build a true home. So I'm asking you all to really take these stories into consideration. And it is clear that this is not the only family that is going through this. Um, a tenant in Burlington is definitely not the only tenant who has had to couch surf in that area or be stressed about when they can find new long-term housing. So I urge you all to seriously consider this new legislation and help these people who should have a roof over their head and deserve to have a roof over their head. Thank you. Thanks for being with us, Madeline. Um, so is Bridget the last one? Yes, last one. Okay, great. We're just sorry that uh, I just want to reiterate that we're we are way way over the time today. So um, happy to have have you back. But if you want to give us some brief comments, that'd be really great. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Good morning. This will take about two minutes, and that should bring us right to our fifteen minutes that we were allotted. I'm here today to talk about my support for just cause eviction as a Vermonter who works in affordable housing, who has been campaigning in Winooski, knocking on doors, talking to renters and homeowners. There's a lot of support out there for just cause eviction. People wanna see it become policy. Um, I am someone who's been personally impacted by a no cause eviction. Last year, my husband and I received a notice that we were being no cause evicted from our rental. The notice stated we had 30 days to vacate and offered no explanation whatsoever. Let me be clear, we were rule following rent paying tenants. We were not problem tenants and the motivation was an egregious rent increase. It's painful for me to even talk about the months that followed the eviction and going through a no cause eviction is destabilizing and traumatic. We went from being a happy, active family to being completely stressed out and anxious overnight. It impacted our mental health, our work, and literally every aspect of our lives. My husband and I weren't even sure if we were gonna be able to stay in Vermont when we were going through our no-cause eviction. There's so little housing available, and I'm not just talking about affordable housing, I'm talking about any housing. 
finding suitable housing for a family of four takes time and it's not something people can reasonably do in 30 days. We were just completely unprepared for anything like that to happen. Just cause eviction policy would have been a safeguard for my family. It would have protected us from the undue stress and hardship of facing an unjust eviction. Nothing could have prepared me for the idea that one day, apropos of nothing, I would get a 30 day eviction notice. There's no reason for that. It's senseless and yet it's a common practice in Vermont. We need to do better. My children are eight and 10 years old and it was impossible for my husband and I to hide our stress from them, so we didn't. We talked to them about what was going on and we taught them that everyone deserves a decent place to live and that housing is a human right. So my children also have a message for you today. They would like you to please support just cause eviction so that nobody has to go through something as unfair as a no cause eviction now. We're homeowners now, thanks in large part to a VA loan. But the last thing I wanna do is close the door on my way in. My family did not become homeless, but others will not be so fortunate. Vermonters need pro tenant protection laws and Vermont renters deserve safe and stable housing. They do not deserve to lose their housing in arbitrary, retaliatory, and discriminatory evictions. Thank you. Thanks for being with us, Bridget. Um, so we don't have a bill before us yet on these specific housing issues. Um, this committee did hear and pass um, a charter change related to this last biennium, and I anticipate we will probably um, have some policy around um, just cause eviction um, that we'll have to discuss um, this year. So I appreciate this kind of preview into what some of the issues are um, because it is very serious and I don't want the limited time that we have this morning to be an indication of the seriousness with which we take that testimony. I really want to appreciate um, the folks who came for the Rad Lobby Day today. Um, we're uh, thankful to have members and, and people from the community uh, come and test, testify here at uh, House Gabbat. So um, thank you all for being here and sorry that we're so crunched for time with our bills now, but I imagine we'll be taking up these issues later in the session. Um, with that, uh, I think what we're gonna do is, um, I've shuffled a little bit of the testimony around, I think, so that we can hear from the Lieutenant Governor on our elections bill, and then we'll take a quick break before um, we dive into the, the last couple of people we're gonna have testifying before lunch. Uh, so just wanted to give the committee that heads up um, that I won't be keeping you solid through noon, <laughs> even though we're a little over time. Um, Andrea's working her magic with me over here to uh, get us back on track. So uh, I want to welcome Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman here today to talk about uh, the draft miscellaneous elections bill that we have before us. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Committee of Jurisdiction. I appreciate it. And uh, hello to a few of you that I haven't quite had the chance to meet, but I think I've had the opportunity to say hello to many of you and some of you I've known for a number of years. Um, I want to first stress the importance of this conversation. I really appreciate that you're having it. Uh, the folks from across the political spectrum and across the issue spectrum greatly uh, are impacted by how our election system works, the choices that they have, uh, the systems by which they get information, and of course, who is then elected and sits at these uh, esteemed tables determining the outcome of issues that many, many people care about, from housing and economic issues, climate, uh, racial or gender inequities, uh, small business rules, development. The list obviously goes on and on. So this conversation is critical. Thank you. Uh, at the end, the foundation of it all is the elections. The rules that we play by and the financing systems greatly impact the choices people have and the impact they have for their voice, their views, to be represented here. So I think I just present that as, as the scale of weight of what you're deciding, I think is quite tremendous. Um, before I get into details, I will say that overarching with many of these changes, and I think there are some provisions in the proposal that are good, uh, many of these provisions actually consolidate party power and reduce transparency 
can reduce options for voters. And I think that's the wrong way to go. Um, I'll go through in the order of the different sections, because that's the easiest. And I will shorten this and get it submitted to you in writing uh, before the end of the day. Uh, first would be the, quote, sore loser provision. What is the problem that is attempting to be solved? And it may be um, that I've missed some instances where a spoiler situation was created when someone lost a primary or ran as an I or another party, uh, but is the potential ramifications of this going to create more problems than it will solve? So in doing our research, and my own memory over 26 odd years, but my memory is not perfect over all that time, I know of one situation where a candidate ran a Democratic primary in an attempt, as many do, to reduce the three-way conundrum in the general election, which then creates the spoiler problem from the sore loser problem. They felt that in the primary, the scales were tipped against them. I think you heard testimony earlier this morning that parties can already do that if they want, either subtly, quietly, which sometimes happens, or more blatantly, the party can say, we want these two and not that one, or this one and not that one. So that can already happen, but it happens rather rarely. In that particular instance, they weren't invited to some of the House parties that were meet the candidates in our primary. So they felt unfairly weighed against them on the top of the balance. With that, they lost the primary, they ran in the general election, and a Republican won. Uh, this would be an example up in Lamoille County, I believe six, maybe eight years ago. I did a little research back uh, before I saw the testimony yesterday. Representative Mariki mentioned this happened in his district, I think. We talked about it after the meeting, maybe 2008 uh, was what uh, was it looked like it was. So with that in mind, uh, going back to 2008, which is 16 years, uh, or 15, 16 years, eight election cycles. In my digging around, I found three instances. Uh, there may be more, but let's, that's what I found. And I tend to pay a fair amount of attention to elections. So three instances out of eight election cycles, 180 seats, that's 1,440 seats with three instances. So this problem has occurred 0.2% of the time. If I've missed three and double it, that's 0.4% of the time. Hold that in your mind for a minute to think about what would happen if folks felt like the sore loser provision was removed. If the sore loser provision is removed, and someone says, well, I could work to be cross-partisan to reduce the spoiler problem and run in one primary and try to get a right in in another, and I'll tie that in later, then what happens? Are they going to choose to run in that primary where they feel they're already going to be pushed out uh, in terms of odds of winning, either through the money primary or through the local district efforts? In which case, why wouldn't they just run in a general election feeling they'd actually have a better chance at reaching more voters? How many more spoiler problems would be created by that? Considering Vermont has a more robust third party and more robust independent, I think last term there were five, I think there's been as many as seven independents than almost any other state, um, is that what you want to create? I'm not sure that's really what the voters would want. Um, with that, I uh, made my point there. Uh, independence filing before the primary. Uh, I think there's a reason why independence would get up to three days or five days, I can't remember exactly what it is, to file after a primary. Uh, in a primary election cycle, uh, it, may, it may turn out that folks think someone's going to run, then they don't. And so suddenly there's only one party with a candidate on the general election ballot. Well, there's a lot of folks that might think differently that would say, well, wait a minute, let's all get behind this other individual as an independent so that we don't have this fringe right or fringe left person as the only option we have. Uh, but secondly, what if there are multiple contested primaries and the winners of those primaries are both fringe or all three primaries are fringe in some way or another or extreme or use whatever choice word is apropos of today's political environment. What if a number of people in the community thought, well, wait a minute, there's nobody that really covers the bulk of the way a lot of people in our town think, or our district think. 
And they'd say, wait a minute, let's get someone to run. Or let's get someone to run for sheriff when you learn of something that happens after the filing deadline has passed. This is an opportunity for communities to do that. Uh, so I, I think it's important to allow for independents to file after a primary. Although, again, I don't have uh, the numbers. I didn't have time to do research. Maybe you have. But I would hope before you change that, you look at how often does that really happen and what are the consequences better? Are they so terrible that they warrant a change, or is this allowance uh, value? Um, I, as someone who's long advocated for campaign finance reform, uh, I think unlimited campaign contributions to a party is just a step in the wrong direction. Uh, I can tell you how hard it is for Vermont's one of the hardest states to raise money, both for candidates and for parties. Uh, on the other hand, I think we've had fairly successful elections. We've had people be able to get their message out. I don't think we need to have huge quantities of money to reach most people in the scale districts that you're all running in, and even statewide. Uh, I think having uh, grassroots networks and developing those networks, parties or networks, organizations or networks, you can reach people with your message. I don't think um, removing campaign finance uh, limitations is a good idea. If anything, uh, I think there's areas to strengthen that. Um, Before you move on, uh, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Absolutely. Um, did you hear the testimony this morning from Mr. Danano from the Vermont Democratic Party about how the cur that current limitation uh, makes it so that a candidate who wants to, for instance, buy into the Democratic Party's uh, voter network, uh, it may already, just by virtue of the limit that we have right now, not be able to, to do that if they're a statewide candidate, whereas federal candidates for Congress and Senate uh, already have the ability to give money to their own party in right. that way? Well, as someone who has run in the primary, I've never heard that uh, as a candidate, we were limited due to campaign finance from having access to NGP van, for instance. Uh, I believe the Paris for a statewide candidate was actually $12,500. I heard something about 10000 earlier, but I, I was unsure what that was referencing. Yeah, the current limit is $10,000. So a statewide candidate can only give $10,000. Can only give $10,000. To their party. So do you want to go into how that ultimately functions and how that works? Do you want to expose that at the moment, or would you rather not? So we, we talked about it in committee already. It's right. that it, it basically forces people to have PACs that then do an end run around that campaign finance limit. So the, the, the desire here, just I just want to be really clear that the characterization that we're you know, somehow going backwards right. in terms of transparency and accountability that we're actually trying in this committee with that language to consider something that would recognize the reality of our election system in a post-Citizens United world. Right. So I, I appreciate that. And, and I will think about other ways to do that. Uh, my understanding is the way that it generally happens is that candidates call people that may have maxed out to the candidate uh, to then ask them to donate to the party for five or up to $10,000. In fact, I think in some parties they can do that twice because some parties have a federal fund and a state fund. So it already, the system already has quite a venue for people to donate too much money. Um, that also just exposes the whole topic of candidates are sometimes considered stronger if they can raise more money for the party than another candidate. And sometimes that leads to preference by some people within the parties as to um, which candidate they want to get behind because they can raise more money for the party. Uh, which is an interesting broader conversation in terms of what's the role of a party, what do parties stand for? Is it about raising more money and therefore who has more power in the system? Or is it about really articulating positions on issues or some of both? I don't think it's actually a binary choice. Um, which actually I think binary choices as a whole is what we're trying to move away from. Um, and that's where some of these provisions maybe limit that. Uh, but I, I do appreciate that. And I will think about if there's another way to do it than opening the floodgates for, and I think the earlier witness testified to this, that, well, what's the disincentive to get two or three millionaires to run for office to then give the party $150,000 each just so that they could just be on the ballot even though they're not really running for office? Um, one could do that through the primary, donate a ton of money. I mean, there's, there's doors that get open. But, uh, and I, I appreciate the, the response, uh, the chuckle, but, um, Given how 
important money is in an election these days, I could see a couple of people thinking craftily, oh, we could do this through its primary, and then they can drop out or whatever and have given all that money. So I, I think it's worth exploring. I just don't know that this is the solution. So I appreciate the effort, and I, I, I appreciate the, the topic. Um, Town and county party committees filing with the Secretary of State, I think, is an interesting idea. I'm not necessarily uh, terribly for it or terribly against it. I could just say that in my town of 5,000 odd people, most folks who are engaged in politics kind of know who the active people are in all the different parties. And um, I think there are other folks who are more quietly involved. They might run a business in town or have relationships with a lot of people across different perspectives and may or may not want to be singled out suddenly as someone in this day and age in politics because Matt, Mr. Byron, is a Democrat. I'm not going to go to his restaurant anymore and we should boycott his restaurant. Now, that's free choice and, and economic choices anybody can make. Um, and obviously, as a candidate, you're declared, so you're a bad example in that way. But since you were used as an example earlier, I thought I'd just pile on. <laughs> but the, 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 the irony of that is, like, you know, I actually have um, encountered instances where my political engagement and activity as a rep and a Democrat, and I have people verbally tell me that they will boycott my business as a result. That's right. just the world we live in. It is. But I think for folks who are putting this, it's hard enough to get people run for office, right? And, and we have to put out our labels and take positions on issues, and we choose to, that sometimes upset people, and that's part of good discourse. Um, but do we want to have everybody, the 12 or 15 people or three people in a local town committee face those potential repercussions as well? Have we gotten to that world around the country? I think much, much more so than here, but I've seen it creep in over 25 years in different ways, and I think it's really unfortunate. Um, so I. I don't think this is necessarily a bad idea. I just think that's something to think about in this process. I just want to ask you, if I'm following that to its logical conclusion. I mean, so if, if people who stand to be on a committee should be anonymous, because that's really what, what we're saying, is that, 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 we're, uh, that we're trying to protect people. And I can understand uh, the suggestion that was made this morning about you know, not publishing the addresses of every single person who attends a caucus. Sure. But if you're going to stand up, you're you're an officer. You're a person who's voting. You have power to nominate candidates for office. Like that's a key part of our grassroots democracy in local elections. We wouldn't allow somebody who is like serving as a justice of the peace, for instance, to be anonymous in their role. So that that's right. what's been interesting to me about the status quo. Uh, for these committees is that you essentially can be a part of multiple committees because there's no way to to check whether people are actually organizing with one party or the other. And it's a really key part of how we nominate candidates and there is power in those local uh, committee members. Yeah, I think that's an interesting dilemma. I mean, on the one hand, we have to remember parties are not public entities. They are actually private entities. They're private clubs that people choose to join or not and choose to participate in just like any other organizing activity. They have to be private clubs that have ramifications in our elections. As far as the nominating aspect, anybody can file a petition with a ballot under any party they want. They don't have to be nominated by a party. Uh, the only time that the party is typically nominating in an official sense is sometimes after a primary, if there's nobody up, they will, uh, the district committee, whatever that happens to be, uh, will gather to make that nomination. One would think that again in a local community or a local district or even an aggregated statewide committee, uh, the process itself pretty well uh, marginalizes the one person or the odd person out there who's got a rather different political perspective than the organization that they're claiming to be part of. So the impact, I think, is pretty small. But I, again, I'm not opposed to it. I think it's, you, you're thinking about really good things and asking good questions, and I'll just throw out one more piece to think about. But that doesn't I'm not going to, uh, you know, sink my teeth into that as the be-all and end-all. I can guarantee you that the, there are two other provisions: the fusion provision, or three provisions. I was the fusion provision, the independent filing after the primary is over provision, and the sore, quote sore loser provision would be the three that I'm probably most concerned about in terms of transparency and opportunity for voters and, and candidates. Um, so let's go to the cross-party slash fusion uh, situation. 
I believe, I know, uh, Representative Byron, you asked the uh, a Democratic Party witness earlier today if he knew how many. And my understanding was that yesterday the Progressive Party person indicated that. I can't remember if he said 60 odd and 70 ran, 61. I don't remember exactly, but I suspect it's in his testimony um, that, that he may or may not have handed it out. But, um, but I think it's really important to recognize there are 60 officials, one third of the legislature, or if you include a couple state lines, it's a fraction under a third, that have multiple party labels. Um, has that been detrimental to the process? Are people terribly upset? Do you hear an uprising from the general public that they're really angry? Um, I, I'm In asking. Franklin County, absolutely yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, just like brand confusion. Sure. Like it, it'd be like you marketing your products from your farm is like conventionally organic mm -hmm. instead of conventional organic, right? They they, 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 they don't really I would have, actually never do that. But sure. No, I understand you would never do that. Nor would any point I'm making is sort of as we're playing with some semantics. No, this is helpful. Yeah, and that is what it experiences. They don't really understand the political product that's in front of them. Representative Hango, I'm Representative Hango. Were you just saying that in reference to Franklin County voters, that they don't understand the differentiation? So, so what, I wanna, what I wanna say is that the issue that came up in the Franklin County Sheriff's race that we're gonna hear about from our next witness is, has absolutely caused a lot of people in Franklin County to question whether it makes sense to have the party nominations go the way that they go. That's why I put this, that is the specific impetus for me putting these couple of provisions out on the table for us to discuss this year. Um, and we'll hear more testimony about that from our next witness. So that's good to know why you put it out, but I don't think that was the issue in the Franklin County Sheriff's race at all, party nomination. Um, both parties came out and, and, and made statements about the candidate who was on the ballot. Um, but after, but after he received, and the way he got those nominations is exactly going to be the crux of the next witness's testimony. I, I don't agree with that, that it was a Republican, Democrat, or Independent, or Progressive um, issue at all. I, 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 I would say, yeah, just, I, maybe you, you might, I really would uh, love to have this conversation yeah. after we hear from some more testimony. Two different topics, though. I mean, you're talking about fusion candidates, right? Right. You're talking yeah. about, like, I'm talking about party candidates. affiliations yeah. for sheriffs. But, but the party affiliation and, and the dual nomination are all wrapped up in what you're going to hear from our next witness. So I would say if we could put a pin sure. and, and finish with the lieutenant governor that on this particular uh, conversation, we're going to really dive into this because it's the, it's the heart of the matter for me. Representative Higley. Well, no, just quickly, and I haven't commented on this yet either, but I've been uh, ran as an RD. Uh, and I believe in my area, it's, uh, because we don't have to declare a party, uh, I, I'm certainly understanding that the D's that voted for me voted for me out of uh, not a concern for the Democratic Party in a sense, which somebody had mentioned earlier that you know that that, that was the case, and I don't think that's the case at all. Um, so, so I don't have an issue with um, you know an RD designation for sure. And, and, and to continue on that vein, I, I understand that it may create confusion for some, but I also think uh, historically, and again, we're seeing this now, I would say nationally with the Republican Party, that there's this breadth and this split of sort of ideologies within the party that people somehow didn't think existed before, but, but does now. And the Democratic Party is a big tent party. There are folks that would argue a single label doesn't really tell you within that party's umbrella where that person tends to fall. Uh, and when people run with dual labels, uh, maybe true in this room, maybe not, I don't know all of Representative Higley's politics, um, but there are certainly instances where there are folks that may consider themselves a particularly moderate Republican and would want to generate that uh, perception and uh, focus for their voters and would want to run as an RD or uh, someone in the Democratic spectrum who may want to indicate they are more uh, progressive than more moderate and would want to run as a DP, or that they're like slightly more conservative and would want to run as a DR. I, I think that's, that's actually a, a helpful choice for a candidate 
uh, and I've, obviously I don't want to leave it out, there are some that run as PDs, so you know, you're looking at one of them, of which there are many, there are fewer this time than last time, but that goes up and down. Um, and it gives people a general understanding of uh, the direction that person leans on a wide range of issues. And even within progressives, there are progressives that are unhappy that I run as a PD. And some won't vote for me because of that, because I'm too moderate for that. Right? So just to let everybody know, I'm moderate to some people's minds. Um, I've often joked that the rest of the world might be moderate. But in any case, uh, dual party labels, I think, give more transparency, not less in most instances. Um, and in some places, it's active. In other places, it's passive, because there just isn't even competition. Well, if we want there to not be a dual party label person in a district, uh, I apologize, maybe I'll use you as an example, then find somebody to run on the Democratic ballot. I mean, that's how you solve that problem. That's not, shouldn't be a problem that then impacts voters in other parts of the state who have that transparency of party labels being multiple. Um, uh, very briefly, gender race, I think uh, if, if it could be aggregated, you know, not individual identified, I think that's valuable information as we're all trying to see, you know, how many of different categories may be elected, but I think, again, the individualization is, is very challenging and could be very damaging. Um, I do agree with the provision that if you are actively seeking a write-in, I am probably one of the few candidates in the state who has done this many, many times, uh, that having the candidate file it a couple weeks beforehand to alert the clerks and let the clerks know. I can give you a direct example. It was either two or four years ago. Uh, there was a very close write-in ballot. Uh, and it then became a, a news kerfluffle because they had to open the, ballot, open the bag of ballots a few days later down, I believe it was in Middletown Springs or a couple towns down that way, because it was actually a one-vote margin. And my campaign knew. We had people that we knew had taken the progressive ballot, or taken the, the ballot and had written them in, and they didn't count them. They were just, there were nine votes in that town. It turned out seven of them were write-ins for me. It clarified the outcome. So I think having that write-in provision is, is actually quite good, because um, it'll save clerk's effort, and it'll save that kind of confusion after the election. Um, and. Uh, I just didn't understand with sections 14 and 15 if those are also something about write-ins, but more local districts. If yeah, so, it's just about the different elections. That, and there, yeah, that's what I thought it was. One, but the one key difference is in the draft of the bill, it allows uh, for the local elections, um, the consent form can be done all the way up until the closing right. polls. And yeah. no, no issue there. I just wasn't sure. So I don't know if I've generated questions and if my time is up anyway. We, we are over, yeah. but I don't And I appreciate you giving me the Yeah, time. no, and, and we will be working on this bill uh, for uh, at least another week or so. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, I, if there are quick questions uh, for the Lieutenant Governor now, I'm happy to. What was entertain. the year of that Middletown Springs example, and what exactly were the implications of that problem? Uh, I, I don't recall. Like I said, it was either two or four years ago. And the implication would be that there would have been a different person running and creating a three-way race in the general under the Progressive Party label, as opposed to the fusion uh, way that I was running. And that individual, if I recall, I think it might have been 2020, because we opened up ballot, uh, you didn't need to get signatures to get on the ballot. Um, I had to beat someone whose name was on the ballot who really wasn't you know, back to controlling who enters a ballot. Uh, they were not a historically active progressive in any way. If anything, they were active in other bizarre ways. Um, and so the implication would have been it would have been a three-way race. But, but if, if there's an organized write-in, you would think that they would then you want those counted. And that makes it clear that that's the effort. Because you cannot file on two ballots. I don't know if you're aware of that. Are we talking about three? Governor or lieutenant governor two or four years ago, which were you? Two years, I suppose it's relatively irrelevant, but two years ago I was running for governor. Four years ago I was running for lieutenant governor. And you're saying seven votes was going to make the difference as to who your competition was? Seven votes was the difference between my write-in on the progressive ballot for that office, because allowing me to run with two, as two-party candidate versus someone else winning the progressive nomination and therefore uh, that not being the case. And also, Mr. Chair, I know time is limited, so what I'd like to offer is um, to give
given 20 whatever years of experience, particularly with a lot of these kinds of provisions, I'm happy to come back or answer questions without uh, sitting in a chair some of the time or meet with anybody. And I imagine we'll, we'll all uh, continue to have these conversations as right. we consider this important piece of legislation. So thank you for being with us today, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. I appreciate you giving me the time. <laughs> one oh, one, 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 one representative. Sure. Biden. So in, in your 20 plus years of, of working in and around fusion candidates, are you aware of any PRs or RPs? Um, I know that uh, former Senator Vince Aluzzi, mm -hmm. as the uh, state's attorney, mm -hmm. has run under all three parties in the past, and would have again had there been a, a I'm talking about that. straight RD or DP, or is the common connecting theme here the D? Um, Coming from one side or the other. I don't know. I think there may have been one, but I honestly don't know. I'd have to go do some but it serious would be an extremely digital. rare instance. Sure. Both are, you know, all of them are fairly rare. I mean, DR, DP, they're all, you know, handfuls of, you know, it's a dozen here, a dozen there. Gotcha. Representative Chase? Would the Secretary of State be able to tell us? Perhaps. Perhaps it might take some digging. So uh, right. I, I think we want to be very specific about what the question we were asking was and why, but right. it's good to, good to think that. I also through. don't know that that's critically important, although maybe it is for some reason. I'd love to hear why. No, I just, I'm just assessing the, the most common connector within all of these. The alphabet soup is the D. Well, I think as we think of the politics as linear, point. Ds are more towards the middle of that range. Mm -hmm. I happen to think politics can be nonlinear um, over time. Uh, but the way our system has worked for a long time, we are, uh, we are sort of stuck in a linear mindset, which frankly, I think, leads to partisanship and leads to some of the struggles versus more triangular. Well, with that, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. So I want to give the committee a very quick break. I know I need to step out for just a moment. So um, we will get back with our next witness. If folks could try to be back in five to 10 minutes, we'll try to get back uh, uh, at about five of. Thank All right, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Scheffler. <laughs> We're back, uh, House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee on this Wednesday, February 15th. Uh, we, our next witness uh, to talk about aspects of our miscellaneous elections bill is the chair of the Franklin County Democratic Party to tell us a little bit about the last primary. And I wanna welcome Zach Scheffler to the committee. Chair McCarthy, members of the committee, thanks for having me and thanks for your time and your deliberation on this issue. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to come to speak with you about my personal experience, what I saw, what I felt, and what I, and what I was hearing uh, during the, well, our most recent primary elections in, uh, in August of 2022. Um, speaking specifically of um, what I understand is DR 23075, sections one, sore loser laws, and section six, uh, cross nominations. I hope that this testimony today serves as a tangible example of a system that um, allows for cross nominations and might lack some provisions um, around uh, or related to so-called loser laws. Um, I think I'd hope to stress um, from my experience, the need for a more representative primary process, the need for increased integrity in party nominations, uh, and just overall the need for more clarity in our electoral process as we you know, work to increase civic engagement in Vermont. Um, I believe there's a compelling state interest for all of these things. Um, and I think that combined with something I'm grateful for, an open primary system, something that gives Vermonters and voters a flexibility uh, to do what a lot of folks I talk to up here like to do, which is vote for the person, not just the party. Uh, those two things or these things combined, I think make for a more um, oh, more representative system. Uh, moving along to bring you back and to summarize a bit of what was going on in August of 2022, particularly as it relates to uh, one of our countywide elections, uh, the county sheriff's election. So um, uh, some facts to put forth for, for your consideration as you move forward to, with your discussions about the text of the bill. Um, John Grismore uh, ran for Franklin County Sheriff. Uh, it's a countywide office. Um, and uh, speaking personally of my experience with the Democratic primary nominations process, just wanted to bring to the committee the fact that uh, Grismore won with less than 250 votes. Um, 
out of what I believe is nearly 4,500 Democratic ballots cast by Democratic voters uh, in the um, Democratic Party nominations during the primary of August of 2022. So again, less than 250 votes out of nearly 4,500 cast. Uh, just days after the primary, a video was released, and this video showed John Grismore uh, assaulting a detainee at the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, following that video's release, uh, both the Franklin County Democrats and the Franklin County Republican parties called for Grismore to step down and to decline the party nominations. Uh, in in our case, this would allowed this would have allowed you know our committee to nominate a replacement and fill the vacancy that um, Chris Moore would have left had he declined and stepped down ahead of our general election uh, later that year. Uh, but Chris Moore declined, uh, and um, you know given that fact, uh, and because he refused to decline, he was not only printed on the ballot, um, but his, well, the number of votes that he won with, again, 250 votes of less than out of 4,500 Democratic ballots cast, uh, meant that this small number of write-in votes allowed him to appear on uh, the, uh, as a Democrat on the ballot. Uh, and it allowed him to have this Republican Democratic nominee status with um, R and D next to his name. And um, I just want to share with the committee that uh, what I found was that this implied that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party supported this nominee uh, and backed him and his appearance on the ballot. Um, to a personal point, and I just want to share, and I can only hope to impart, um, the uh, incredible amount of confusion that this caused among primary voters and carried through into uh, the general election, uh, an immense amount of confusion, lack of clarity um, around how this came to happen, um, a la an amount of confusion that um, demanded a lot of explanation, not only in the press, but personal conversations I had um, with fellow party members about how uh, you know, John Grismore secured the Democratic um, nomination with so few votes, uh, an amount of votes that wasn't representative in any way um, considering that, you know, uh, so the small percentage that um, that earned him and secured him this nomination, it was incredibly fraught. It was incredibly difficult. It was incredibly confusing, uh, and comments about the lack of clarity uh, were were many. Um, for me, uh, I would support any action uh, that um, the legislature could take to increase the integrity of party nominations. And when I say integrity, um, I mean, any, any steps that we can reasonably take partnered with uh, our open primary system to reduce um, things that uh, have been discussed at an incredibly high level in this country. I was uh, reading a bit about Storer v. Brown, Supreme Court, um, and reading a bit into a paper published by the Congressional Research Service uh, regarding sore loser laws and other ballot access issues. Um, and uh, ballot nomination issues. And um, increasing integrity means that we would have uh, we'll carry, we would have less um, inter-party rating in the nominations process, and also uh, just uh, reduce intra-party feuding ahead of a general election. Um, I would support any action you could take, uh, and I thank you so much for considering this. Um, I think it's reasonable to ask folks uh, running for office in a party primary uh, given that they're open, to pick a lane, and choose which party to run under, or if they choose, run under no party and run as an independent. I think that Vermont system, with these added provisions, uh, would be incredibly strong and helpful um, as we move to an increased civic engagement, increase clarity, um, and reduce the level of confusion on the ballot uh, as it's put forth um, and as it's given to voters. And again, just to reiterate, um, this primary process in August of 2022 was, um, well, it was, uh, it was deeply upsetting to members of the party. Uh, it was deeply upsetting to voters in general. And uh, the amount of 
press, the amount of personal conversations, the amount of intra-party conversations, the amount of deliberations that we had to go through. Uh, and I had to work with you know, my partner uh, across the aisle here in the county, at the county committee level, the county certification level. Uh, it was a lot. Uh, I don't know if it was helpful. I would argue that it was. And so uh, thinking about the text uh, that y'all are studying today and that you're working through um, today and in the weeks and months ahead, um, I would, uh, I'd be interested and, and highly support any measures that y'all could take around sort of loser laws and to clarify this uh, and, uh, cross nominations process. Uh, Zach, that's really all I have to say for now, but I'd open it up to any questions, Chair McCarthy. Did it feel like an insurmountable challenge to have uh, a candidate who, you know, out of 4,500 roughly Democratic ballots cast countywide, got a couple hundred votes, uh, to have them holding the Democratic nomination for you to get the call? Uh, you know, what, what was it like to answer the calls from people who, who were asking you, why did the Democratic Party endorse this guy? <laughs> Right. Um, what was the particular word you used? Well, what, so insurmountable. yeah, did it feel insurmountable to to like endorse a writing candidate and then try to make that happen? Like the the process that we went through, um, and that you know you were at the the kind of the center of a storm along with um, the chair of the, the Franklin County Republicans trying to support a writing candidate. Did the fact that there were both of those nominations on the ballot create kind of an insurmountable challenge for you? I would say, I would the, say amount the amount of energy, energy that it took, took to, to verify the conversations that I've had and also to go through the current process to, um, you know, you know find a uh, write in, in alternative candidate for folks to, to give people an option to vote more representative party. party. It was, uh, it was it highly, was highly, 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 it, it was, uh, it was troubling. Was troubling. Um, I don't know I don't if know I would use, use the word insurmountable, the, the amount of energy, energy that it took to, to do any of these, um, um, to rally behind it, warm voters, voters a choice, choice, give them options. Option. It was incredibly tough. tough. I would use I the word incredibly tough. Thanks. Representative Hango. So I hear what you're saying, and I, I lived this because I'm in Franklin County, and I was also a candidate on the ballot and also a voter. Um, so I don't understand what removing a party label on the ballot would have changed about this particular election. To me, it was um, really a name recognition. It was not a party affiliation that got this individual elected, duly elected, may I add. Um, whether I'm for or against the election of this individual and what party I belong to has no bearing for me on this situation at all. So could you further explain how removing a party label would be um, beneficial in a situation like this? Should it ever come up again? Yeah, I yeah, think I back, think back to, to, you know, again, again the first first conversation, conversation, conversation that you had to have with have folks, across folks across the county, county Democratic voters across the county, across the county, across the county. Um, um, who would have who specifically would have pointed, pointed to, to uh, the lack of representation they felt in that was so, so low, low line so low, low for a a candidate, a candidate to secure, secure uh, the nomination. nomination. Again, yeah, yeah, just point to, to for the committee's own deliberation, uh, the fact that in the county, the county 4,000 voters, voters casting the ballot that did not vote for Chris Moore, I should say, say 4,000 that, that cast, cast um, only you know, 237 of which um, um, wrote in a particular candidate's name, and that secured the nomination. Party. I guess it I would just, just I would just point to the fact that there was a, it's a representation issue, issue uh, and I don't feel that Democratic voters in the primary process, process the party party process, process felt particularly represented. represented. Looking at the numbers, I would, I would say that that, that um, kind of solidified their opinion that it wasn't a representative system and that something that needs to change. Zach, would you say that voters who saw the Republican slash Democratic nomination that of the one name printed on the ballot, that many of them were probably assuming that both of those parties were supporting those candidates, maybe had missed your press release and Chair Luno's press release? Yeah, yeah. Um, that goes uh, back to my point about clarity. 
uh, there was a lack of clarity. There was confusion around the, the party labels of the on the ballot and the impression that voters were given by. So yeah, uh, just pointing again to lack of clarity uh, and uh, the amount of confusion that should be in what I imagine that at the situation at first was, was quite a bit. It was uh, notable. It was very serious. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if you want quite, to follow up. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite done with that. I don't think you really answered my question, unfortunately, about how removing a party label would establish clarity. In my opinion, that would um, perhaps muddy the waters even further because um, people who are, for instance, staunchly Republican or staunchly Democrat would then question, OK, we've elected somebody. What party do they belong to, even though maybe a sheriff shouldn't belong to a public uh, a, a, a political party? But that's another conversation totally. So how would removing a party label establish clarity? Um, could you? Uh uh, re rephrase the uh, your, the clarification. Can I try to capture what I think you're getting at, Representative Pango? And you can try. tell me if I'm. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but I'll try to ask it in a way that I, that I that I think would be helpful. So, what does it mean to a voter when they see the party next to the candidate's name? That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, what does it mean to a voter if they see no party? What it, what advantage is that? What are you trying to accomplish by removing party labels? Um, um, I would just, I just point again to that, that kind of voters, voters expressed to me often, which is, um, you know, it's about the, the many voters, many voters per person, person and not the not number. number. So, uh, so uh, I guess I would just say that, that um, putting candidates in the ballot who are clearly uh, and, and, um, and with, with significant intent um, um, are endorsed by a large number of Democratic other party voters. Party voters. I, feel I feel like, like having candidates on the ballot are clearly supported by their party, party um, uh, is important. And, and I would leave the, the rest of that discussion as to who to support uh, up to folks and their and personal political inclinations, or if they have that, um, you know, you their know, relation or, or connection. Thank you. I appreciate that you're representing one particular party's view, but I did want to make it clear to folks who may not have followed the election that both the Republican and the Democratic parties endorsed this candidate prior to the election. So now we're having this That's conversation. Not That's not the case, actually. So it's not. Before the election, that candidate for sheriff only appeared on the Republican ballot. Is And the Democratic party in large part because that particular candidate had um, been endorsed by the sheriff did not actively recruit. And if I recall that correctly, am I, am I right, Chair Scheffler, that the Democratic Party wasn't really focused on the sheriff's race because those aren't really seen as partisan races. We don't do a lot of activity around the probate judge's race or the, or the sheriff's race typically. But I understood that before the general election, this person was endorsed by both parties. Am I incorrect, Mr. Shuffler? To my understanding, uh, in the primary, Chris Moore ran under the Republican primary ticket, um, and he uh, and there was no candidate on the Democratic uh, in the Democratic primary. And I would just to add clarity to the discussion: um, in the general, Chris Moore received uh, Republican and Democratic labels because a very very small number of Democratic primary voters, two hundred thirty-seven. Um, wrote in John Grismore's name on the Democratic primary ticket. I mean, and because of that small number, speaking for a large number of, of uh, Democratic primary voters, uh, and the lack of representation that some folks felt, uh, Grismore received the Democratic nomination. But uh, to your point specifically, Grismore ran on the Republican ticket in the primary. He did not run um, on the ticket printed on the Democratic primary ballot in the Democratic primary. He received right in votes. So I've got a bunch of hands up. So then <laughs> Nugent was first, the Chase, and then Byron. <laughs> um, 
So I appreciate what you're saying. I think this has clarified for me some of the, um, like where the issue is. And um, I guess I wanted to, to say something and then see if this is correct. That the, so when a voter goes to the polls, they're looking at the name and the party. And I think, I'm not sure every voter in Vermont or um, every Vermont voter um, sees it one way or the other, that this would be an endorsement from the party. Um, because in this state, the people who are voting decide for themselves if they're Democrats or if they're gonna vote on the Democratic um, ballot. And, they're, and they also are the ones who are deciding who gets that Democratic nomination. So it's very like people driven. Um, rather than the party saying, like, here's who we're putting on the um, ballot, which, you know, I think it could bo go both ways. I think in history, parties have decided and then done that. They put that on the ballot. Um, and we just have a very, like, much more bottom-up process from what I'm under, you know, this is really crystallizing that for me. Um, and I guess, you know, is there another way to handle this confusion, which would be educating the public about, about that. Like when you go into the voting booth, you're acting as a member of the ballot that you're uh, participating in to nominate your party uh, candidate rather than trying to do it like ahead of time or do it this. Uh, is there a specific question? I can, uh, that uh, seems like a deliberative question. I would be happy to give that to the, the committee to discuss. Unless there's a specific question embedded in there, I'd be happy to answer it. I guess just am I getting that right? Um, I, I, I think maybe what Representative Nugent is trying to, to get at, Zach, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the tension between the fact that we have open primaries, and then once we get to the point where the primary is over, that party label that's on the general election ballot, it means different things to different voters, because some voters are really aware of how open our primaries are and what that means. And a lot of voters, I think, assume, and, and was it your experience, Zach, that a lot of voters who saw that the Democratic not, you know, label was going to be next to that Franklin County Sheriff candidate's name, along with the Republican one, assumed that the Democratic Party, like you as the chair, for instance, were supporting that candidate. Yeah, um, I would say that the fact that 237 out of 4,500 folks uh, provided this nomination uh, and then therefore you know, this candidate appeared with our party's label next to it, signaled to uh, the majority of people that the party uh, as an organization, as an entity, as a, as a, as a political body uh, endorsed, that, uh, endorsed that candidate when the reality of it was, was that the result was, was not indicative, reflective, or representative of the party's wishes or intent. Uh, Representative Chase. Um, thanks. Uh, would it be accurate to say the way things played out basically caused uh, those write-ins to lock up the um, the label so that you couldn't put anybody else on the ballot even after the primary? I would say that um, using the words locked up, um, it, um, it secured this particular candidate the nomination, yes, and it forced us to um, given that the candidate did not decline or step down from receiving that nomination, it forced us to mount, um, you know, a separate, uh, it okay. required us to mount additional measures in order to, you know, uh, work on behalf of, of the voters to give them uh, other options on the ballot. Yeah. Okay. And if I understand it correctly, the uh, proposals uh, put forth in this draft, um, would have left that position open so that you could easily put somebody on the ballot with that label uh, to provide the ultimate choice. Is that accurate? I believe that the provisions in the text um, would have helped clarify our nominations process and make it clear to Democratic voters that, um, you know, Chris Moore may have in fact not garnered the support of the majority or even a the majority of the Democratic Party uh, and party voters. Thank you. All right. Uh, one last question. Representative Byron. 
Okay, this is more of a thought bubble, um, but I'll position it <clears throat> towards the county chair. Um, has there been any discussions on the possibility of a, like, a provision saying that a major party would reserve the right or have the opportunity to reject a write-in candidate if they didn't feel, I mean, I'm kind of building off of the name conversation of vetting. I have not um, asked Zach to prepare for that question. Or so. just, <laughs> just throwing it out there, right? Like, I mean, well, if you have somebody who comes in on this right-hand side and like they don't represent, a, a, you know, one of the parties like ideological vein, policy vein, you know, functional approach to the role they may play, I'm just thinking like, is there again thought bubble? Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, so, the, so that's a, we should have this discussion as a committee about is there, are there other ways that we could accomplish there being this clarity? You know, that's, that's kind of what we're getting at, but um, the, um, yeah, there's probably a lot of different ways to skin that cat. I think the tension that we run into there, Representative Byron, is between the, the voters of Vermont, I think, want the ability to have these open primaries, and, and Zach was getting at that, that he's not testifying against us having open primaries. Um, I think Vermont voters, in my experience, really want to be able to you know, grab the party ballot where their candidates are to, to boost the person that they want um, to get that particular party's nomination in a given year. Um, but then on the flip side of that, there isn't really any check for a party other than just putting out a press release to say like, hey, this person who got our nomination isn't really the person we endorse. We'd rather you vote for somebody from the other party or, or write in a candidate. Um, in this particular instance, I, I think Zach summed up pretty well what the consequences were, but that's another idea that um, I think is worth putting on the table. Um, Zach, we've kept you way over time. Representative Hooper has one last question. Um, Zach, for the sake of personal clarity, in two sentences or fewer, could you articulate your ask of the committee today? Um, I would simply uh, ask you all to consider the text and understand that it would be very helpful to uh, party members as we uh, look to boost engagement in the county. Well, I guess are you asking for a removal of party affiliation <coughs> sheriff's candidates? Is that one of your requests? Or is that not? Uh, no, I wouldn't clarify. I wouldn't characterize that as my request. I would simply say that the text as written in sections one and six, I think is great work. I would I'll ask you all to continue along this line of thought uh, to provide clarity as to, um, well, to give parties the mechanisms in place to clarify the candidates on this ballot. Thanks for being with us today, Zach. I really, really appreciate your time. Hey, I appreciate yours, and uh, thank you for considering this. Thank you for working through this. Uh, I just appreciate all your work, and I uh, really hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Take care. You too. Adios. All right, next up, uh, I really appreciate uh, Liz Medina uh, from the AFL-CIO has asked for some time to testify about our elections bill, and I appreciate your patience. Our scheduling today has been a bit of an accordion. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it sometimes happens. Absolutely, and I appreciate having some time here today. So um, for, for those folks who uh, may not have seen me as much around the State House, I do spend a lot of time you know, visiting Member, work, 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 the member workplaces and uh, local union halls. So my name is Liz Medina, and I am the executive director of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, which is our state's largest federation of labor unions, and we represent over 13,500 members in this state. Um, we're a growing labor federation thanks to some amazing organizing, uh, AFT and AFSCME and other affiliate local, uh, parent unions and locals. And I, you know, with all due respect to the previous witness, um, I really am not seeing a problem. Uh, what I hear is that the party may have to communicate more with voters if there's confusion. And from my organizing perspective, that's a very good thing. So I want to put a pin on that and um, encourage people to think about that as well. And I'm going to speak some really hard, honest truths about where our members are at. And I hope you can listen to them um, and 
uh, appreciate them for what they are aware of voter, what voters are feeling these days, at least among working Vermonters. And um, our, a lot of our members feel alienated, frankly, by most political parties, especially the two traditional parties. And we uh, struck out a new vision for the labor movement in 2019 to really try to find our own political path forward, a new vision for the labor movement. I, in full disclosure, was part of the reform slate in 2019 called United. And we ran on a 10-point program, which was officially adopted when our slate won in 2019. And one of those points is a new orientation toward electoral politics that reflects what our where our members are at. And at this convention where we were elected, it was one of our most well-attended convention that we've had in decades. We had over 100 delegates there, and we won overwhelming support for every single seat of our executive board of our labor council. And party politics was a big component in that, and one of the biggest debates we had. We really want to see autonomy from political parties, and that is one of the points of our program, uh, number six. And what's important to us more than uh, party affiliation is what a candidate is willing to do for working people. And we see the fusion uh, can, uh, process as one way that helps us as union members uh, understand better and with full transparency and clarity where exactly a candidate would, may stand within that two-party system. Because these are big tent parties and there's a lot of difference within each of them. And we really need to know where these candidates stand. And I think, you know, with the struggle in this country to have viable third parties, the fusion process is really one of the best options we have for parties and candidates that don't have a lot of resources to signal to our members and other working Vermonters exactly where they stand. And so I find that particular provision of the election reforms um, to be problematic and um, I, you know, just heard about this yesterday, and I called uh, some of our leaders and board members about it, and they were equally uh, perplexed. Um, Katie Harris of uh, Ask Me 1674, Howard Center, secretary of that local, you know, really doesn't understand why this is even a proposal, because she does not see this as helping her members understand um, who they should vote for and endorse. Um, so. With that, I will say, you know, I think that's a, it's, it's solving a problem that is, doesn't exist and can only probably create more problems. Um, I would also say, you know, as a working class organization, I find it concerning that we are putting more money in politics, and particularly allowing candidates to give unlimited contributions to political parties. I don't see how this can do anything other than entrench existing social and economic inequalities in, in politics and in the state. Um, we need to, as um, my colleagues yesterday so eloquently stated, really try to do more to take money out of politics and look into uh, public financing of campaigns and campaign finance reform. So I, you know, I can just say that I, I know that our base um, is not going to be supportive of anything that makes it harder for them to have alternative uh, party endorsements or candidates or more information on candidates that requires the parties to maybe not work with voters when there is confusion and actually organize and talk to voters. So I think that's all I'll say. Um, Liz, are you open? Do you did you want to end your testimony, or are you open to questions? I don't I'm want to. I'm open to questions. I, I don't yes, want to force you in a conversation. Yes. But every once in a while, folks yes. have clar clarification, and and I just wanted to ask um, that I, I really take to heart the um, the call that you made in the beginning of your testimony to make sure that candidates um, you know reach out and uh, are. Um, not just trying to work inside of one party. I think what you were getting at was that the, the sort of, you called it the fusion system. Mm -hmm. I would say that the ability to run with your two parties, two, two parties, it sends a signal, it's a communication, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that is, is it really necessary to communicate that sort of affiliation or feeling of having shared values with two or multiple parties 
needs to be done on the ballot or whether you know this is about you know candidates organizations labor unions etc that are involved in our democracy communicating better so it's like the the thing we're looking at is that specific issue of what is the state's responsibility in our managing of primary elections in our publishing of the the nominations on our general election ballots to a lot to facilitate multiple party nominations and is that a virtue or not that's really the question that we I put on the table it's yes to both i think they need to see that that's part of communication having it on the ballot and also the parties need to communicate as well i know that a lot of our members um, would not even probably participate if they didn't see that there were some kind of fusion candidates because they're so alienated from the two part traditional two parties any further questions for liz Representative Hooper. All right. What do you think your organization's role is in doing what you think the party should be doing in terms of differentiating between fusion? You've historically put out a scorecard of how people who are in office vote on issues that you've put forward. you put forward a slate of issues that are important to you. Um, why is it not incumbent upon your organization to make sure that either by interview or some other fact um, that you know where they stand and that conversely your membership knows where they stand? We do do that. So, so then why? I, I don't necessarily see where somebody who sees uh, the absence of it two-letter designation on a ballot but say I'm not voting uh, that seems rather strange. Well, we have a lot of members and so we may be able to reach some people but we're not going to be able to each reach every single one of them. And so our signaling in support of particular additional third parties or other candidates, you know, only ha has a certain amount of reach and I think that additional ballot information is really vital for the broadest base of our membership. The more we talk about uh, this, Mr. Chair, the more I think that we are crossing a line over into what parties could and should be doing to regulate their own business, and that we are maybe not on the solidest ground regulating it for them by legislation. Yeah, I, um, we'll, we'll have time for committee discussion on this, but I would say uh, we, we've had a variety of witnesses over the last uh, morning and afternoon testify, and I really appreciate you being here, Liz, um, and offering your perspective that um, many of the, the, the discussions that we've had have gotten us thinking about things that aren't actually in the text of the bill, and I think that's important because there's a, there's a lot there, and there are other ways that we might think about addressing some of the concerns that have been brought up. Um, so I would say yes in the conversations, absolutely. I don't think we're getting too too far afield in the text of the, the bill that we're looking at in terms of having this question about what's the state's role and, and what guardrails do we want to put on our primary system. That's kind of the, that's squarely in our jurisdiction. But I think you're absolutely right. We, we've gone down some tangents in terms of what the relationship is between the parties and the state and uh, other important institutions in our democratic process. And um, this is, these are really important conversations. I take them really seriously. I want all voices to come to the table and tell us, don't do this, yes, do that. Here's another thing to think about. Um, so we've got a lot on the table on this elections discussion and we'll, we'll keep working uh, on aspects of this bill and have more time for committee discussion. Um, I think that our next witness is in the Zoom room probably. So Liz, I want to uh, maybe one last comment from Representative Rowicki, and then we'll let you go. And <laughs> we, we have one piece of testimony about something completely different. <laughs> Just a quick observation about the diversity within all the various factions here, because I think you've got a union guy here, the uh, state employees union, union person here, and still trying to come together. Yeah. It's a complex, messy thing doing democracy, isn't it? Mm. Very layered. <laughs>
Very important, though, and I appreciate you uh, giving me some time to share our members' perspective, and I um, look forward to maybe working together in the future on some election reform that I think would be really impactful. So thank you very much. Thanks, Liz. All right. Um, so I'm going to put uh, the pause button on our election conversation for now. And